so Martin, uh, most importantly, uh, is, they got, is a first Don of black belt in Shotokan karate, <laughs> <laughs> which I believe is not an anti-aging endeavor. I think that's a pro-aging <laughs> sort, of, uh, sort of thing. But anyway, after getting his uh, black belt, he uh, then went on to get his PhD at the University of Copenhagen, um, where he spent a lot of time at the National Institute of Aging, uh, researching the role of DNA repair in the aging process. He then went on to get his postdoc at the Buck Institute, which is a uh, leading institute for uh, anti 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 aging science. Uh, and then recently started a company called Gordian, which you can see emblazoned across his chest, <laughs> uh, which is a really cool company that enables uh, high throughput in vivo screening of gene therapies. So you can test a bunch of gene therapies in an actual animal uh, to combat uh, complex diseases of, of, of um, well, complex diseases and hopefully aging. Uh, and He's also written a book on intermittent fasting, which has been translated to English. Yeah, no. Okay. So if you want to know about that, just come talk to Matt. Uh, with that, take it away. All right. Thanks, Seth. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. I hope that um, by the end of the talk, you'll know both about sort of why should we care about aging. Um, what's going on right now? What's the biology you should pay attention to? Feel free to interrupt with questions um, throughout the talk. There's going to be one or two breaks in the, um, not in the middle, but in the thirds, where you can sort of go to the bathroom, you can do more extensive back and forth. Um, but yeah, please be interactive. One question. Yeah. Is HQ a black belt? How did it get here? Um, <laughs> PhD. <laughs> Similar. <laughs> All right, so before, oh, let's see, there we go, now it's on. So before I start, I just wanna thank Impact Tech for hosting, especially um, logistics team, Alex and Drew, for setting everything up. Thanks, Seth, for the introduction. Also, thanks my friend, Kia Winslow, who did the initial, let's make these slides a bit prettier uh, run. And then I hardly need to do this uh, after Seth's introduction, but who am I? If you ask NIH grant reviewers, I am fundamentally a hardcore scientist, which pleased me just as much as getting the grant. Um, I did my master's in nano uh, biotechnology in Copenhagen and then the PhD, as Seth mentioned, wrote a book while I was in the military because I was mandatory in Denmark and then um, did my postdoc at the Buck Institute looking at mitochondrial function um, and ways that stressing mitochondria can make fruit flies live longer. I got a grant to go start a lab to fix Alzheimer's in fruit flies, um, decided that that wasn't a direct enough path to fixing aging in humans. And so gave back the grant um, and started Gordian, which we'll touch very briefly on uh, towards the end, but this is not the topic of the talk. I also recently started something called the Longevity Apprenticeship, um, which is basically a program to train more people to have both good taste in aging and a sense of what it takes to run a larger project because um, we need more operators in the field. We'll get back to that as well. And one of the apprentices is here in the room. You can like try to find out in the breaks. <laughs> so there's gonna be four sections. First, um, what's the problem? Second, what actually do we mean by aging? And then we're gonna do a tour de force of biology and then at the end, talk about what's happening right now, what are the biotech companies, what are people trying to do, and what are the big challenges for the field. So starting with aging. Um, aging is the reason that all of these curves go up together. Right? Um, and we'll get a little bit more specific than that, but in a sense, all you need to know is that every disease that you're probably worried about getting or know someone who has um, and don't like is probably has aging as the number one risk factor. And each of these areas obviously is a huge economic cost. These are just the direct costs only in the US of each of these diseases. So whether you're interested in sort of like your own health, um, humanity's health or finance, like aging is a good place to uh, focus on. And as a reminder to everyone in the room, you are on the way to the right. <laughs> so your risk of disease is exponentially going up. So why is it that if you Google sort of cancer risk factors, you're gonna get some pie chart or whatever that looks something like this. And you know, don't smoke, we know that one. Um, don't eat the right foods. Why don't you get this, which is the truth, right? That aging is much more important than any lifestyle change you can make in avoiding cancer. Um, and I think the reason is the same reason that we don't talk about sort of luck as a risk factor. We don't feel that we can do anything about it. And so 
Why even bother to bring it up? You can't just de-age yourself. Um, but the question, of course, is, is there something we can do about it? Maybe because of this, um, the aging field isn't getting a ton of funding at the basic research level. So in the US, um, the NIH is the main source of funding. And if we look at the 2017 numbers for how much funding they allocated to the different institutes studying different things, um, aging got about 1.2 billion for um, research. But of that, half was earmarked for Alzheimer's disease. There's a big Alzheimer's initiative in, uh, during Obama. So a lot of the aging researchers are now doing sort of Alzheimer's or fake Alzheimer's research. Um, if you look at the other, you know, when you get your grant to look like it's Alzheimer's. Um, <laughs> So if you look at the other diseases that are these age-related diseases, like neurological diseases, um, and each of the different organs where, as I mentioned, the diseases that we are talking about have aging as the number one risk factor, they all get a lot more money. Cancer especially gets the most money. If you add them up, you get uh, 13 billion. And so the amount of money that we're studying on researching the basic processes that are the cause of most of these diseases is about 5% of what we spend on studying the individual diseases one by one. To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, for those who are entrepreneurs, if I told you, you know, your company is failing, you don't have enough sales, it's like, let's optimize the font on our website, you know, <laughs> not the most efficient thing. And that's, you know, looking at, comparing it to the research uh, funding that other areas are getting. If we compare it to how much money we're spending, uh, in the US on healthcare, it's, I can't fit it on the screen. You have to imagine that there's like three more bars going this way. Um, clearly, we're spending a whole lot more money on solving the problem after it's appeared than we are in preventing it, which uh, is not a good idea if we can actually prevent it. So why are we doing that? And I think a big reason is that while aging has been a topic of interest for thousands of years, um, there hasn't been a lot of success stories. Um, the early investments in the field uh, haven't really paid off. For example, uh, Chen Xiu Huang, the first emperor of China, had a bunch of anti-aging uh, scientists working for him. They told him to drink Quicksilver. It didn't work. He died. Um, maybe, maybe not from the Quicksilver, right? But that's just one you know, humorous example. The main point is that there's been a lot of people promising you eternal life for a long time, and none of them have delivered, as far as I'm aware. So is anything different now? Um, yes, is the short answer. We have found genetic pathways where if we change them, this is uh, the graph you're looking at is sort of a lifespan curve where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is uh, the the fraction of a cohort of animals that is still alive. And so they all look like this, and basically the further out to the right they go, the further the animals are living. You'll see a few of these. So have they done the same experiment where they like, do the mutation like halfway through instead of at the relevant halfway? Um, for IGF-1 in worms, they've done knockdowns, so it's not the same as mutating the gene, but if you knock it down later in life, then uh, yes. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't work. We'll get into that more in the biology section. Um, so here we're looking at a bunch of worms. This is um, three decades ago. The first mutations in worms were discovered. They're in the insulin sensing pathway. Um, we'll get back to that as well. But the main point is you make one mutation in one gene and these worms live twice as long as a normal worm, right? So if nothing else, this tells us that aging isn't some sort of entropic physics process that we can do nothing about. It is something that to a degree at least is under biological control. More data in that uh, direction is if you just look at different animals um, that are similar in let's say size or they're similar in their metabolic rates, some of them live a lot longer than others. Um, naked mole rats notoriously are sort of weird in any number of ways but including in not getting cancer and living you know, 10 times as long as a mouse of the same size. Humans don't, you know, we're sort of apart from the animal kingdom, right? Like biologically we're not, but we are unique in that we have all this technology and so forth, and we don't really consider ourselves similar to anything except maybe a primate, but that's like a stretch, right? Um, but if you look at the diversity of animals, there are many examples where it's like pretty similar, but dramatically different rates of aging. So the human equivalent, which we don't have, um, but is biologically feasible, is basically like Tolkien elves, right? They live for thousands of years and they just stay youthful forever. 
Um, like that is a real thing that happens to you if you're a mouse, except you know, the elves are prettier than the mole rats. I don't know. <laughs> there are also organisms that seem to be able to reverse their aging. So this is uh, tiny jellyfish, um, Turritopsis dornii, um, that goes through a life cycle like other uh, organisms where it starts out as an egg and then it has a maturation cycle and then it gets to be an adult. And where most organisms at some point then age and die, the um, Turritopsis can enter a different stage where when it's old and damaged, it kind of just turns into a teenager again, regenerating most of its body um, and seemingly comes back into the life cycle um, at a totally young state with no issues. Okay, this is a weird jellyfish. Is this like in any way relevant to humans? Would humans ever be able to do this? In a sense, we already do, um, because that's where babies come from. So we don't regenerate our own bodies, but we do take one pair of cells from an you know, adult or even old uh, couple, mash those cells together and regenerate an entirely young body, right? So one cell in your body has whatever program is required to create an entirely young human body. The way it works for us evolutionarily is that you know, that happens as a separate organism, not as a regeneration of your own organism, but there's no, in principle, reason why uh, that would have to be the case. So that's kind of, hopefully, uh, an argument that aging is important and that, yes, in the last few decades, we actually have um, gained, to some degree, control over the aging process. Far from perfect, uh, which is, of course, why the rest of the talk exists. But let's talk about what, what is aging, right? I've just said the word a lot and I've said, this is why you get sick, but what is it? In one sense, you know, we're very good at recognizing it. If we just look around the room, you can be like, oh, this person's older than that person. Um, but we're sort of stuck with this, I'll know it when I see it, uh, definition of aging. We don't have an exact, like this is the process that happens. Um, and I wanna spend a moment on uh, different uses of the word. Um, depending on the context, because I think people use the word aging, and I have done that myself just now in the introduction. They use it to refer to different things that all maybe deserve the um, label of aging, but that are not the same thing. And so what we've talked about so far is, let's say, aging as a whole, organismal aging, everything that happens that makes you older and less fit and so forth. Um, but if you go to the Buck Institute and you go into a lab, you'll find that the students and researchers there are studying specific mechanisms of aging. So they're studying like um, senescent cells or DNA damage. And that's what they refer to as aging. There's clearly a connection between these two things, but it's not the same thing. Um, and then if you go to Congress or if you go to your doctor's office, they might refer to aging as Alzheimer's disease. Right? Like these are the things that happen that we don't like as we get old. That is aging because that is what the actual problem is. And so these, again, are clearly related to um, the rest of the process, but it's not necessarily the same thing. And you can't just say that everything that's good for aging is going to cure Alzheimer's, for example. And so I think the way that you should think about it is that if we go back to this chart, there's some process of aging that... Um, happens and over time makes you less fit in most ways, um, biologically fit, not just sort of exercise fit. And that is being driven by processes that are being studied by aging biologists. So all of these things is, are the reason that as time passes, you will on average get worse and not get better physiologically. And then the diseases are the results of that. They're the outcomes of a fundamental process. And that fundamental process is what we would like to address with drugs or therapies and so forth in order to impact all of the diseases. So what we would like to do is bring you down here um, biologically um, to a point where you don't really get these diseases. Okay, a few more things in the intro. Um, one is every year or two, there's a paper that comes out and then there's a bunch of newspaper articles that say there's a fundamental limit to human lifespan. Humans will never live more than, you know, I think 120 was the most recent one. And uh, this is just clickbait. Uh, these, <laughs> these studies are not unprecedented because they happen every few years. And what the studies do um, as a rule is they look at how has lifespan evolved. So what has, how has lifespan gone up for humans? 
And then they say, well, if we project forward, then we're not going to be immortal. And that makes sense, and that's probably a true statement. Humans aren't evolving towards immortality within the next you know, thousand years. But it's also a little bit like saying, okay, let's look at the high jump records from the Olympics and see how high humans can get off the ground. And then over-dramatizing the conclusion to be humans will never fly. Like, yes, that is true if our attempt at flying was only based on jumping higher, but that's not really relevant, right? And so as an example, uh, it's a little bit busy chart from our world and data. Life expectancy is on the y-axis and then uh, time uh, is on the x-axis. And uh, the colored dots are, that's, this is the actual life expectancy um, at these different times. And then the horizontal lines, this thing isn't lasering at all, right? No. no. Um, the horizontal lines are people or organizations who have made a prediction about the maximum lifespan. <laughs> and the tick is when they made that prediction. So actually this one's pretty good because they made a prediction here in like 1928, but already then the lifespan was higher <laughs> than uh, what they predicted was the maximum. So I'm not saying there is an absolutely no limit to human lifespan. I am saying that all the studies that you might hear about that say so aren't actually, they're not looking at human lifespan um, modulo technology. Um, there's a different sort of uh, dichotomy in the field between health span and lifespan. So health span is like, how many years are you free from disease and ailments? And lifespan is how many years are you like legally alive or at least feel alive? Um, and sometimes people get into arguments about these. They're sort of, we need, we need to extend health span. That's the most important thing, quality of life. Forget about lifespan. And the other people are like, no, immortality. You know, lifespan is the only thing that matters. I'd rather be sick than, you know, dead, which I would also rather be sick than dead. Um, but, um, the field doesn't really have ways of doing this. We don't have ways of getting you to a point where you're really sick, 80 year old, all kinds of things wrong, and then we just keep you alive. Like that so far, that's not, normal medicine has done that, right? Like ventilators do that. Um, arguably chemotherapy uh, does that in some cases. Um, but the drugs that we're finding in geroscience or in aging biology aren't really doing that. So I think it's a false dichotomy. I think that so far the things that we, the progress we've made is this sort of progress. You live longer and you're healthier for longer and you avoid diseases. And so I don't think there's a big need to have this discussion yet. I think if we find drugs that can keep you alive in a really um, shitty state, then we should have that discussion. Um, but for now, mostly when people argue one way or another, it's more of a philosophical sort of ideological discussion. Um, that's something that actually will guide our behavior. Um, okay, the last thing I'll say about aging specifically in the introduction is that it used to be that we were looking for sort of the answer to aging. Like it's DNA damage and because DNA damage, then everything downstream of that is gonna get worse. And so clearly this is why, you know, the whole a organism ages. Or as we show here from 1956, it's free radicals you know, it's chemical modifications to all the parts of your cell, and that is why aging. Um, I think at this point, not very few people at least are trying to propose these sort of, this is actually the whole explanation for everything theories. Um, we're more at a point where we recognize that different, uh, these different mechanisms that have been proposed are important, but multiple ones are important. I think the best evidence for like single cause not working is that you know, if you do one thing to a mouse, you might make it live 10, 20% longer. Um, but A, it doesn't, it's not like 10x longer. And B, there's like 10 other things that also will make it live 20% longer by engaging different biology. To me, that's the most compelling. Like, it just doesn't make sense that there is like the single cause. Um, the other thing that is increasingly happening is that we're realizing that these causes are connected, right? Like that if your mitochondrial function goes down, that actually affects your ability to repair DNA through your NAD metabolism and things like that. And so there's gonna be more about this um, later in the later sections. Um, but I just wanted to give you a, at least sort of like slight offering of, okay, here's actually what aging is, even though uh, I'm not strictly defining it. Aging is a bunch of stuff that goes wrong and it uh, puts you in a worse state and we don't have a perfect definition that's better than that. <laughs>
Okay, so before we move to the next section, one thing I'll mention is that um, we're gonna be looking at, you already saw some worms, right? And we're gonna be looking at different uh, results that come from different species of animal. And so are those at all relevant? If we look at nature and we see plants and fungus and flies and humans, these look very different to us, right? Like you don't feel bad when you kill a fly or eat a plant even. Um, but biologically, we're not that different. Um, I'll just point out one important aging pathway, the mTOR pathway, a bit oversimplified um, in yeast and in humans. And you can see that like, okay, there's different protein names here, but the machinery is really similar. And so in general, there are a lot of similarities in biology and the things that we study in model organisms often at least are present in humans. They might work a bit differently. Um, and so it's not that everything that's true in yeast is automatically true in humans, um, but it's also not true that there's no point in looking at yeast because it can't tell us anything about humans. Um, just as an example of that, um, I would say it's biology is universal in the same way that sort of code is universal. There's different coding languages. But if you say, oh, I have this cat and over here is this jellyfish and it's glowing and it would be really cool to have a glowing cat. <laughs> why don't I just figure out what makes the jellyfish glow? It's green fluorescent protein. Um, and then I'll just put that DNA into a cat and then the cat will glow, right? Yes, it will. This is a glowing cat. This is not a Photoshop image. Uh, that is a thing you can do. It doesn't always work, just like if you just copy paste code, you know, from one language to another language, it doesn't actually just work immediately. Um, but there is a universal shared language, um, which again, just means that the results that we find in different model organisms can be relevant. So <laughs> I've called a lot of slides here, but it's still kind of a tour de force where I'm gonna go through different areas of biology um, it is heavily weighted towards things that I think are actually important and then a few things that uh, you may think are more important than I think they are. And so let's cover those. Um, I'm going to go through both things that break at the organismal level and these intracellular processes. Um, I'm going to start with tissues, which is pretty sort of recognizable. And then I'll go into the extracellular or intracellular processes that drive uh, t loss of tissue and loss of cells. And so we'll talk about DNA, we'll talk about proteins, and we'll talk about metabolism. And then we're gonna loop back um, to things that are particularly important from a systems biology point of view, from like everything is connected. So we're gonna talk about specific cell, se cell states, including stem cells and senescent cells. And uh, we're gonna talk about signals between uh, cells and how they impact the aging process. So let's start with tissues, more relatable. Um, this is a picture of, or two pictures of thymuses. And uh, the one on the left is a very young thymus and the thymus role is to educate or to create naive T cells. And so it's part of the whole immune complicated system whereby immune, new immune cells are created. And on the right is the thymus at 24 years and it's mostly been replaced with fat. So if anyone here is like, 35 plus, you probably don't have a thymus anymore. It's gone. It's just all fat now. Um, whether that, sorry? That's sad. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> there are some people working on thymus regeneration. Um, Greg Fahey is one. So um, it's not, since we, we lose it and we like, we haven't found a great way to put it back yet. It's not 100% clear how well, you know, this could be coordinated with other things taking over those functions or whatever. So it's not 100% clear how much this exact thing limits your lifespan, um, but it is just representative of what happens in other tissues. So if you look at your muscle um, and you look at muscle in a young person and then in the middle young muscle in an older person, you again see that a lot of the tissue is just replaced with fat. You have an, sort of decellularization of many of your tissues where they become you know, less useful, let's say. And on the right, with a lot of exercise, yes, if you exercise, this is gonna help, certainly in the muscle, but uh, maybe also other tissues. Uh, it's gonna help, but it's not gonna make you fully young. So we have this um, loss of functional cells, and it's both a loss of actual cells and it's, um, a loss of cells doing what they're supposed to be doing. The immune system, I didn't include this here, but the immune system becomes uh, heavily 
biased in the types of cells that it contains with age, uh, and that leads to you being less functional, your immune system being less functional. So I'm gonna end the tissue part there. It's just like, yes, stuff is happening in a way that you can relate to from the images. Why is it happening? That's probably more important. So let's start with DNA. Um, probably most of you know, DNA is kind of the blueprint um, of everything that happens in your body. Um, it encodes for RNA, which is the action bit in terms of nucleotides. So genes are expressed as RNA, and then they become uh, proteins, and proteins are the effectors that uh, do things inside of a cell. This is oversimplified. Um, and the way RNA is translated to proteins is that triplets of RNA bases um, become single amino acids. So you've got this kind of three-letter alphabet that gets turned into amino acids. And so DNA damage theories of aging were some of the earliest, and it kind of makes sense that if you get an error here, let's say we delete a couple of bases, um, then that's going to propagate down into all the biological function that happens. You're going to lose it in the RNA. You're going to lose, because you lose it in the RNA and RNA works with triplets, this doesn't just like kind of create a small error in the protein. It completely messes up what's going to happen. And often you just get dead protein function. So it would make sense that if DNA uh, gets damaged, you would then have loss of protein function. Everything would just get worse over time. Um, intuitively makes sense. Evidence, not so strong. Um, it's hard to measure what the actual rate of accumulating damage uh, in human tissue is because there's only like one damage site and the technical errors in the ways that we try to measure it is often bigger than you know, the actual amount of damage. That's all we can tell. It's, the people are work, some people are working on this in very sophisticated ways, but it's pretty low. We can't really measure it. Um, and we have a bunch of DNA repair. So there's most of the damage that happens, a lot of damage happens constantly. Most of it just gets repaired. What we don't really have, what we do have is that sort of, if you accelerate the amount of damage accumulation, for example, in these mice that have a mutated enzyme that replicates mitochondrial DNA, and so uh, they accumulate a lot of errors in their mitochondrial DNA, and they have these, so the bottom mouse is normal and the others are uh, the mutator mice. They have these accelerated aging phenotypes with their fur and they get kyphosis on their spine. Um, and they, uh, they die a lot sooner. So if you accumulate a ton of DNA damage, you become unviable and you, it resembles accelerated aging in some way. Um, there are also human syndromes like Werner syndrome where it looks a lot like accelerated aging and the proteins involved are certainly involved in maintaining DNA. Um, but what we don't have is like, I boosted your DNA repair, I fixed all your DNA damage, and now you live longer. So kind of the jury is still out on exactly how important uh, DNA damage is for uh, the aging process, um, absent that can we modulate it to extend lifespan and absent really good correlations between aging and DNA damage. You can fix, so once you've broken something, we can fix this, and I, not for this particular study, but there are ways where like, okay, we remove one protein that's important, then we put it back, and then you kind of repair. But it's much easier to break something than to optimize it, and so that doesn't prove that normal aging happens through a deficiency in being able to repair DNA or an accumulation of DNA damage. It just shows you that if you have an acceleration of DNA damage, then uh, it looks like aging. Um, but yeah, do, does that make sense? Sure, but I mean, it's not like a, you don't have, I mean, you could partially damage, I mean, aging, I mean, the mice are dying sooner, so that does seem to be aging. I mean, if you're removing that, and then they're not dying sooner, so, or they're dying proportionally. Yeah, yeah. So I guess let's take an example. Let's take an example. Um, I'm gonna go into your bank account, I'm gonna take all of your money, and then you'll be unable to pay your bills, and so your house is gonna get repossessed, and so you're going to be homeless. Um, and if I give you money back, now you can have a home. Does this prove that all homelessness is caused by sort of money disappearing? Sure. No, but it does say this is a good way to become homeless. Or <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and so I would say the jury is out on how how big a role does the accumulation of DNA damage play in the average aging process? 
but DNA damage certainly can drive aging and quite plausibly does in the normal aging process. Have people looked at different species with different longevities and their DNA accumulation of damage or repair mechanisms? Um, yes, and it's very hard because the amount of damage that accumulates is pretty low and the damage will be, you know, it's not like you're, you have one thing that you can measure and then you just measure that in every cell. It's like this cell gets this type of mutation and there's many ways that DNA can be damaged that seem more or less important and probably by species. So my impression is that none of that is really conclusive because we are so limited in how uh, precisely we can measure DNA damage. Um, you see the biggest effect in mitochondrial DNA. So it may be that mitochondrial DNA mutations are more important than in your uh, somatic. So you have two um, genomes. You have a small mitochondrial genome that just encodes for 13 proteins and exists inside of all your mitochondria, which is sort of a um, metabolic organelle inside of your cells. And then you have your, the rest of your genome, which is um, the part that encodes for everything else. Um, and you get bigger effects when you see mutations in mitochondrial genome. There are some mechanisms whereby it might make sense that mitochondrial mutations are more important, uh, notably that uh, mitochondrial genomes are divided in normal cells. In many cells in your body, the um, somatic genome, is, the nuclear genome is not uh, dividing. And so in mitochondria, you could imagine that the mutations get to propagate um, and therefore you have a bigger effect. I would say that's sort of uh, theoretical the most part, but we do have this type of data. Okay, let's talk about telomeres, right? Telomeres, so what telomeres are, are this is your whole, your chromosome, which is a bunch of bundled up, all your you know, billions of base pairs, um, and the ends are telomeres, and they are sort of buffers that contain repetitive information, and when your um, chromosomes are replicated, uh, there's a bit missing at the end, but don't worry, we're just gonna eat part of the telomere. Then when the telomere gets super short, we can't replicate anymore. And so the discoveries by Leonard Hayflake um, decades ago showed that if you had cells in culture, uh, normal human cells in culture, and you kept dividing them, they would eventually stop dividing and telomeres were um, found to be the reason and uh, telomerase won a Nobel Prize, etc. And so it kind of, again, intuitively, it would make sense. You got this thing that just like ticks and then it runs out. Uh, but if you think deeply, more deeply, uh, or look more deeply into the biology, it doesn't make any sense because some cells in your body divide all the time, like your um, intestinal lining or your skin, and some cells in your body never divide, like your muscle or your brain cells. And so if it was just like the clock runs out and then your body can't regenerate anymore, and then, it, you know, then why don't we all die from like burst stomachs or, you know, like <laughs> holes in our skin? or something like that. So that's not to say that, you know, telomeres are completely irrelevant for aging. Uh, they're not, um, but they aren't like this single metric of aging. They're, they too are not the single cause uh, of uh, the aging process. And the immune system, they're pretty important. Um, but then again, there's this protein called telomerase that extends telomeres. And in most of your body, that's not active, uh, but in some cells it is, uh, and it can be reactivated. So, Let's talk a bit more about what actually does maybe seem to happen with telomeres. As I mentioned, there are these repetitive ends. Their structure is this loop that forms up upon itself. Um, and when they get short, what happens is that this loop unfolds. And when that is detected, when like floppy uh, chromosome ends are detected, um, all hell breaks loose in the cell and there's a bunch of DNA damage signaling because it looks like a break of DNA. Um, it can trigger cells to go into what's called senescent state, which we'll get back to a little bit later. Um, and it just affects things in a way that for that cell can turn it non-functional and uh, that non-functional cell can trigger inflammation and cause um, issues in other cells. So very short telomeres do certainly seem important. And there's a correlation between um, your mortality and the length of your telomeres. So long telomere people uh, in both sexes, they tend to have a longer uh, lifespan. There's some caveats here, um, a bunch. Normally you measure when you have, you know, human patient samples, what you're measuring 
in the telomeres or what you, the way that you measure telomere length is in blood because you can draw a blood sample. It's usually not like your brain because you know you need it. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, blood telomeres play a special role because your blood cells are uh, dividing a lot, uh, but also there's telomerase activity. And so there is a correlation between your blood telomere length and that of other organs, um, but it's not perfect. Um, and just like with DNA damage, you've got kind of the same sort of like, we look for a causative study, like a, a study where we can prove that if we lengthen the telomeres, it's better. There are some studies like that uh, that have been done. One of the organisms we use to study many things in biology is uh, mice. And mice have dramatically different telomere dynamics. They start with way longer telomeres than humans. So if you want a mouse with short telomeres, you have to like delete telomerase and then wait for multiple generations um, before they get short telomeres. So, you know, it's hard to say exactly how representative it is um, of humans. So telomeres are a part of aging, but overappreciated, or at least uh, commonly represented as more important than they probably are. Let's go to underappreciated. Um, sure. So if it turns out that uh, shorter telomeres weren't driving aging, do we know what the causal mechanism is that, that causes telomeres to get shorter in older people but not have it matter that much? Um, it could matter. It could be that the telomeres are downstream of other things. And so there are different other aging stressor types that um, lead to shorter oh, telomeres. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't, in most cases, I don't know how exactly that happens. In many cases, nobody, like, that's not part of the study. Um, but it could be that other, the causality is flipped, right? Like, things that changed by the time you're old lead you to have less, uh, to have shorter telomeres on average. Okay. But we don't have an answer yet. I don't. <laughs> I don't. It is possible that there are things known that I don't know uh, about aging. Um, Okay, so what's something that I think is underappreciated is um, the loss of proper organization of DNA with age. And so we looked at the chromosomes, it's all packaged up. Uh, the way this works is that if your DNA is a strand here, a lot of the DNA is packed into tightly uh, sequestered chromatin, called heterochromatin, where it's wrapped around proteins tightly and so it's inaccessible and so RNA programs are not running off of that DNA. Um, some of it is accessible and, um, and is running uh, RNA programs. But with age, this all gets messed up. Everything gets messed up with age, right? But what happens is some of the DNA that's supposed to be inaccessible becomes accessible and vice versa. And We'll get to in a second sort of why that might be hugely important, but I'll note here just one of the accelerated aging disorders, Hutchinson Guilford's progeria syndrome, um, where you know this is a 10 year old or I think a 13 year old specifically. Um, what happens there is that uh, the membrane, the nuclear mem so what you're looking at here is the nuclear membrane with the DNA. Um, sort of the heterochromatin attached to it, um, because of mutations in specific nuclear membrane proteins, the organization gets disrupted. So that's what we know sort of physically happens. Like this is clearly um, the single mutation that drives the disease. How that propagates into sort of all these aspects of aging is not 100% well understood, but at least um, it somehow has the ability to drive something that looks like aging isn't necessarily uh, full normal aging. And so I, the reason I think this is important is if you think about two different cells in your body, you know, your brain, you have a neuron, and then your skin, those cells have the same DNA, right? Like the DNA is exactly the same. Why is one brain and one skin? Like how do we keep that organized? And of course the answer is that your DNA is just like all of the code and then which programs are actively running um, which macros are turned on out of all that code then determines what is the state that a cell is in. And this is self-reinforcing. So, you know, the way it happens is you have these promoters where transcription factors bind and then they turn on a gene and it has to be accessible like we just talked about. But then the genes that get expressed, some of those um, in turn are the 
repressors or activators that turn on programs. So what you end up with is this self-reinforcing, like I'm running this program and this program keeps like rerunning itself and that's why your skin stays skin and doesn't just like spontaneously turn into liver uh, because of some slight fluctuation. And that's homeostasis, right? So we talked about homeostasis as aging. It's the ability to sort of like stay on course, um, just like a startup. So, <laughs> If you lose DNA organization, if you lose your chromatin state, then all kinds of things can happen, right? And your cells can get into a state where they're just not really doing exactly what they're supposed to. And I do sometimes think of aging as like, you know, the aging of a human body is similar to like the failure of an old incumbent company, right? Where it's not that you can point your finger at exactly like, oh, you know, the CEO took all the money and ran and that's why the company failed. Possible, rarely the case. Um, it's more that like, you know, these guys don't like these guys. There's no clear vision from the top. Sales are stagnating. The engineers are demotivated because sales are stagnating. And so they all quit and we hired some subpar guys. And you've got this like dynamic system that gets out of whack and just gets into a decline. So that's kind of how I personally think about aging. And for that, um, the epigenetic state of a cell is important. You want the cell to be focused and doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing and responding appropriately to um, certain events. We will get back to epigenetics a little bit more so, in a minute. So how does that change over time? Or what do we know about how that changes over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, sadly, I'm going to come back again with like only partly understood. Um, it seems clear that, so there's an ongoing discussion around like, is it just stochastic? Like things are randomly messed up and it's all just random noise and people try to measure like, is this just pure noise behavior or not? I don't think that's settled. Like, is it noise or is it sort of either evolved programs that actively are doing bad stuff as you're older and they just never were evolutionarily selected against um, because there's little evolutionary selection in age. That's kind of one uh, viewpoint or theory. Um, or is it just like stochastic damage? That is unresolved. Uh, some of the things we do know happen are sort of specific epigenetic changes over time. We don't know exactly what's causing them, um, but that tend to create this, oh, so go back a little bit here, um, where you get some sort of DNA damage and then there's kind of like a sequestration of like this DNA, we couldn't repair it and so you get, let's pack it away. Um, and so some of the other mechanisms that drive aging uh, do change it. We are gonna get to metabolism uh, pretty soon and so the way the chromatin is organized depends on various proteins that modify the histones, which is what the DNA is uh, wrapped around, including sirtuins that you might have heard about um, as another aging mechanism. And so they use substrates that come from metabolism, from mitochondrial metabolism, NAD. And so you can imagine that you get screwed up mitochondrial me uh, metabolism and now the sirtuins are less active and therefore you get less active sort of reorganization. Um, and the whole thing, of course, is like a dynamic equilibrium, right? Like you're, you need to, con you need to tidy up entropy constantly. Uh, otherwise your body is going to like become a mess, right? It's like a kid's bedroom. Um, and so if that doesn't, if the default is, if you aren't properly tidying things up, then you will get into this entropic messy state, which I think is often, that's what aging is. Is it disorganization always one direction? As in, certain DNA is accessible and not accessible? Does it go both ways? Both ways. Okay, let's move on to proteins. So proteins are like the effector molecules of everything that's happening in your cell. I'm not gonna cover everything that proteins do, right? Like by any means. So this is gonna be a short section where I just talk about one specific aspect of proteins in aging, which is that when they are translated from RNA, as we talked about, they get translated as a long chain of amino acids. And that then has to fold into some sort of functional 3D shape um, in order for them to, to do what they are supposed to do. And so the body has mechanisms that help with this folding, but it can go wrong. And there are a range of diseases where, notably neurodegenerative diseases, um, but also in other organs, 
where what's going wrong is that you start accumulating these misfolded proteins, they nucleate um, more aggregation, and so you end up with these large aggregates. Now, we just had the Adderhelm approval, um, which is based on the theory that Alzheimer's is purely or mainly caused by aggregates of a beta. There's a lot of evidence that actually goes against that theory. So I'm not saying here that uh, you know, each of these diseases is only caused by this thing or that all of aging is driven only by protein aggregates. But when you have an increased amount of uh, protein aggregates, it tends to correlate with reduced lifespan. And so fortunately slash obviously, um, the body has a bunch of mechanisms. Oh yeah, I just said this part. So aggregation, bad. The body has a bunch of mechanisms that reduce aggregation. So you can take these misfolded proteins, you can refold them using chaperones, um, or you can just degrade them, or you can do what's called autophagy, which is self-eating, so the cell digesting parts of itself. Um, and this happens a lot in starvation states, so if you're doing fasting, which we'll get to. Um, I'm just gonna give one example of autophagy, where in fruit flies, um, HG8 is one of the proteins that's involved, and so when you see plus, this means we're overexpressing um, an autophagy protein, we're boosting the amount of autophagy. What you end up with is less misfolded proteins, less proteins that are shitty and need to be degraded, um, and you end up with a longer lifespan. This particular overexpression is only in the brain. Um, and when you delete that same protein, you end up with a shorter lifespan. So this is the, a better version of what we were talking about before, where not only can you show that if you break it, it's bad, but also if you have more of it, it seems to be good. Um, it's complicated just like all things, but in general, there have been many studies where when you boost the um, body's ability to correctly fold proteins and avoid aggregates, you end up with less li uh, longer lifespan and less um, neurodegenerative disease, especially. Another uh, protein area I wanna zoom in on is uh, the proteins that are outside of cells. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, a cartoon of skin. So at the top, you've got your keratinocytes that are sort of all your, your skin layer that's on the outside and it keeps producing more cells. They keep dying. That's all your fluff that you know your bed bugs eat. And all of those cells are resting on a bed of what's called extracellular matrix. So it's like the, the structure around the cells that they exist in. And there's other cells down here called fibroblasts um, that secrete this extracellular matrix. And so the matrix is full of collagen and other generally fibery types and like water retaining proteins um, that like are essential. Like they are the bed on which these other cells uh, rest. And if that's not there or if it's messed up, um, then the other cells don't behave properly. They get all these cues from how stiff is the tissue, um, which uh, proteins are in there and so forth. And so with age, and this is one of the sense, you know, extracellular <laughs> junk. Um, with age, there's all kinds of bad things that happen uh, to these fibers. There are these chemical crosslinks that form um, and basically tie them together and prevent them getting degraded. Normally it's a, it's a dynamic environment where proteins are getting degraded and new ones are getting secreted. Um, but get these accumulated proteins that can't be degraded um, and you get a change in stiffness in the tissue, which affects all kinds of things. It tends to lead to fibrosis. Um, and obviously wrinkles. So this area of the extracellular matrix is not studied that much, uh, partly because it's harder. Um, you know, cells are self-replicating. Extracellular matrix is not self-replicating. So you can keep a bunch of cells in the lab. This is the oversimplified version. Um, and we're, we're missing, you know, they're all proteins. We're a lot better at looking at DNA and RNA than we are at looking at proteins. So there's different technical challenges that mean that um, ECM hasn't been studied a whole ton. It definitely has been studied and it's clear that like ECM changes happen with age and I don't know how they affect lifespan, but they certainly affect uh, beauty, which also many people care about. And they probably also affect lifespan. There's, there's no way they don't. Um, we're gonna get back to some of these intracellular uh, things uh, and fibrosis and so forth in a later section. Um, those were the, um, the prime components of your cell, the DNA and the RNA and the proteins. Let's talk about the process of metabolism. Um, and so if we go back to the long-lived worms here, the gene that was actually mutated was uh, the receptor for IGF-1, that's the name in, in humans, 
Um, and as I mentioned, it's part of sort of insulin nutrient sensing pathways. And in fact, the majority, I think, at least an overrepresented uh, over fraction of the genes we found that regulate lifespan do so by acting through some sort of nutrient sensing pathway. Um, insulin sensing and mTOR are the two big ones. Um, and likewise, more of the drugs that we have that seem to um, change lifespan, for instance, rapamycin, um, affect these pathways. So rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR. Um, mTOR stands for target of rapamycin. So that one was named in reverse. Um, and it's an immunosuppressive drugs we use um, during organ transplantations. But when you give it to mice, in this case, you give it to mice at 600 days. So it's kind of halfway through their lifespan or more than halfway if they're um, untreated. You give them rapamycin, even at that late age, you get an extension both of their mean and uh, maximum lifespan. And this has been pretty robust. Like rapamycin has worked in different organisms. They're testing it in dogs um, for, for lifespan as well through something called the dog aging process, uh, project. Um, it has also been not rapamycin itself, but sort of newer variants of it have been tested for various age-related conditions. Here's some data from a paper by uh, RestorBio where they looked at respiratory tract infections um, in, in older people. They gave them these <laughs> immunosuppressants, but everything is complicated as we'll get to. Um, and they had a lower incidence of respiratory tract uh, infections. So they, this one was actually tried clinically and failed for other reasons. Um, the main point is that you have this sort of nutrient sensing that apparently, I would say, triggers some sort of switch in your cells that make them age slower or like de-age or something, right? Like there's some sort of master program here that ties uh, metabolism to, to aging. Probably most people are sort of aware of the concept of caloric restriction, which is most lab animals are fed ad libitum. They just eat everything, um, just like us. And uh, when you restrict that eating, in this case, um, this is from a decade old study in um, rhesus macaques, where they were fed 30% less food than what they had normally sort of equilibrated at. Um, one of these was caloric restricted, one of these was not. Um, this is probably a slightly cherry picked uh, picture, but <laughs> nevertheless, it's pretty strong. Um, on the right, what you're looking at is um, the length of the line is, is the lifespan um, of the cohort. And the hatches here are incidents of specific age-related diseases. And so on the top is cancer, then cardiovascular disease, and then diabetes. Diabetes especially is just gone. Um, but you can see that there's a reduction uh, harkening back to this health span, lifespan thing. They live longer and they had fewer diseases. Um, the effect was pretty small. There was another study in primates um, where they, how was it? They avoided all the diseases, but the lifespan extension was not uh, statistically significant. Um, but this caloric restriction stuff has been done to a wide range of organisms, um, including flies and mice and primates and sort of everything except humans, also to humans, but not in a, in a well-controlled way. And it's been very robust, but uh, there are, one or two important caveats. Um, if you take a population, so most uh, lab mice are inbred, they're all genetically identical. If you take a population of wild mice um, that have different genetics and you put them all on a certain amount of caloric restriction, let's say 30%, um, half of them live longer, half of them don't live longer. Um, and so there's some sort of interplay between what's your genetic state and what is the right amount of caloric restriction that can make you live longer. It seems like there is some amount um, but it's hard to say what it is. And so this has obvious implications for humans um, because while, the, you know, there's this argument against it that like, oh, it's only because lab grown animals are like super fat and like, it's just going back to normal. You know, for the average American, you know, that's <laughs> not a good argument, but okay, what about people who aren't overweight? Does it still work? There's some evidence that it still works, but what is the right amount of caloric restriction for you? unclear and the only way to find out kind of like takes your whole life. Um, so as a practical, you know, like, is this a thing you should do? I'm not like, like it's, there's pretty strong evidence and yet it's hard to say exactly how you should do it. Um, quick side question. 
Very uncommon. Okay. <laughs> I, I just don't see charts like this. I'm, I'm yeah, excited yeah. that someone spent their entire career managing this. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And they, they better get some more. They got some science papers okay. already. But <laughs> <laughs> No, and this is, you know, we're going to come back to this as one of the big challenges for the field is that aging takes a lifetime, right? Yeah. Like, it just, it takes too long to do, to test all the things. Um, another topic that uh, we mentioned in the beginning is intermittent fasting. And so this is the idea that it's not about restricting the calories. Um, and there's also work where it's like restricting only proteins. Really, it's about having periods of starvation. And so if you take mice where you... Um, limit their food to not being available all the time, but um, it's only available between then and then. Um, the most common regime here is alternate day, and so they just have food today and no food tomorrow. Um, often when you do that, they end up caloric restricted. People have done studies, this is one of them, where they sort of controlled for the diet. And so the curves you're looking at here is like how much food are they eating um, over different periods of the diet. The red guys here are um, they are being caloric restricted. You can see that they're eating less. The blue are just not getting food constantly. They have periods where they aren't fed, uh, but they end up eating the same. They just eat more during the eating periods. Um, and they end up living longer, not as much longer as the caloric restricted animals, but still live longer. And there's some other studies in this direction. Um, also, a totally different study, you know, with induced myocardial infarcts, uh, intermittent fasting, uh, improve the recovery and reduce the amount of injury you had. There are other studies on, especially autoimmune disease. There's even some human studies on uh, autoimmune disease and asthma where um, intermittent fasting seems to reduce the symptoms. So there's, just like with caloric restriction, there's a good amount of evidence that periods of fasting um, are probably good for you. There's all kinds of theories about why that is. It's like, it's because you're using beta oxidation instead of burning sugar and that creates less ROS, or it's because you trigger autophagy, so you clean up um, a cell or it boosts DNA repair. Maybe some or all of the, well, some are definitely true and maybe all of them are true. Um, the sort of specific mechanism isn't fully understood yet. Um, what's not as clear is how long should you fast? And so when I did it, I did it for, um, I guess, four years total, uh, three of which was during my PhD, um, where I would do roughly alternate day fasting. Um, sometimes it was 24 hour periods, sometimes it was calendar days, but something like that. Um, and that was because this is what they did to the mice. And there was like one study where they did two days on, one day off, and then one one, and then one two, and one one was best for lifespan in mice. But Mice have much faster metabolism than humans. Maybe one day on, one day off. In mice, it's like one week off, one week on. In humans, <laughs> I don't fully know. Um, there's a lot of people in the uh, bodybuilding, um, the, I was gonna say field, I don't know if it's a field, but community, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, use intermittent fasting as a way to cut weight without having a lot of protein loss, um, and seems to be effective for that. They usually fast for like, 14 hours or 16 hours. And so there's a lot of sort of 16, eight um, intermittent fasting happening. Um, I do that also myself sometimes. I don't know if that's gonna make you live longer. Like there's a different perspective. It might well be good for your sort of like weight loss, um, but do you need a longer fast in order to engage these uh, longevity mechanisms? We don't know because we don't know exactly what the longevity mechanisms are. Like there's definitely something there, um, but we haven't really sort of reduced it to engineering yet. <laughs> uh, how will we find out? I would say what you should do is, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm biased by, I love pooled in vivo screens, as Seth indicated. <laughs> I would say that you should get some animals and you should knock out every part of the genome and then you should do intermittent fasting and you should see when we compare cells that have a given gene knocked out, um, when we measure their transcriptome, which genes do we knock out? And then they don't respond to the intermittent fasting anymore. And it's more complicated than like just doing that because cells can talk to each other and there's different things, right? But like some kind of, what you need is a functional study. Like the gold standard for this is like, how does this work? Well, let's delete a gene and then see that the lifespan effect goes away or whatever the effect is goes away, right? But the problem is there's 22, 3,000 genes and you know, maybe you need a combination and all that stuff, but can only do it in vivo. This doesn't make sense to like do intermittent fasting to cell culture, right? 
And so let's, we'll get back to like, why do you need in vivo screening uh, in a bit, again? Yeah, so for this time restricted feeding approach, like when do we typically start these interventions? Is this like started immediately post adolescence or like started at a later age? All those things have been tried, including like very early, like pre-development, like before they're mature. Is there any variability in the effect size? Um, in caloric restriction, I don't remember if that has been done like late age. Oh, it has. I don't remember the results for intermittent fasting. Caloric restriction, it seemed that the earlier you start, uh, post maturation, the better. Stronger effect size. Uh, yeah, I remember there's a study showing that you should still exercise during your intermittent fasting to prevent like muscle loss. Uh, Certainly the bodybuilder field <laughs> says that, but no. Um, that would make perfect, I don't see any reason why that would not be true. Um, because you probably don't want muscle loss, that muscle loss correlates with shorter lifespan. Um, when I did it, I was still exercising. I couldn't go quite as hard, but I could, and I would usually do uh, aerobic exercise rather than sort of like weightlifting, um, because you still don't have like protein to rebuild up. Um, I don't know if that's, that was sort of hand wavy. Um, some other question, no. Okay. What about caloric restriction versus like restricting different types of food? Yeah. So um, we can go back here just for show. So there's caloric restriction and then there is like, oh no, actually you only need to restrict proteins. There's some studies where they just restrict proteins and that's all you need. Um, and that seems plausible. Um, I don't know. Nobody's like, usually these studies are done differently. And so it's not like super head to head in all the different conditions, but like that seems plausible. And then we can go one step further. So some studies suggest all you need to restrict is the amino acid methionine in your uh, diet, and then you'll get the full benefit. Um, it's kind of hard because it's in a lot of things, but uh, why would this make sense at all? Why is it like methionine is like the devil's work or whatever? No, <laughs> it's because um, we talked about codons. So like triplet uh, RNA bases that lead to one amino acid. Uh, one of those codons is a start codon and every protein starts with a start codon. And the start codon is methionine, it codes for methionine. So if you don't have methionine, um, then you can't start making proteins. And so maybe it's just that reduced protein translation is actually giving you that benefit. Most of those, I'm not aware of any like methionine restricting um, studies in um, sort of larger organisms. Like people have done that in flies is the most complex organism I know of. Um, you definitely, just like with the others, you wanna reduce it and you wanna reduce it some amount, but you don't wanna eliminate it. So one of the models for like liver fibrosis in mice is methionine and choline restricted diets where they don't get any, and then you get liver fibrosis, so not good. <laughs> okay, so let's just go to sort of, uh, what is the big picture story of, um, you know, nutrient sensing and metabolism and aging. And the oversimplified version is that when you have a lot of food, Evolution wants you to grow and reproduce and make babies. This is your only uh, mission in life, according to sort of evolution, right? Spread your genes. Um, and so when food is abundant, do that. When food is not abundant, what should you do in order to maximize your gene spreading? Well, you should not make a baby because you can't feed it and then you just both die. Uh, you should not die because then maybe later there will be food and then we can resume the gene spreading activities, <laughs> right? So that's kind of, again, it's hand wavy sort of evolutionary theoretical biology explanation, um, but it is consistent with the observations that like, why would you live longer when you do caloric restriction or intermittent fasting? Um, so if in doubt, and you're looking at some aging stuff, if there's more nutrients, it's gonna live shorter. And there's gonna be exceptions to that, but that's kind of a big picture takeaway. Okay. I think it's more likely to be the latter. So that's a good slide title upgrade. Um, <laughs> the evidence that I've seen is more the latter, that like you have more autophagy and so you get rid of protein aggregates and those kinds of things when you have scarcity. Um, could cause damage in the sense that when we talked about intermittent fasting before, when you're burning uh, carbohydrates, 
um, you are creating more reactive oxygen species uh, per sort of calorie than when you are uh, burning fats. And so in that sense, maybe there could be a cause, but in the first place, it's not 100% clear how important those ROS molecules really are for aging. So I think, I think you're right, and this slide is in, uh, inaccurate or misleading. <laughs> it's good. You don't improve every day, you know? Okay, so let's talk about cell states. Um, the first state I want to talk about is a stem cell. So a stem cell, uh, maybe most of you know, it's a unique, um, it's not a different type of cell because it produces other cells. Um, it is a unique state that a cell can be in where it's got different metabolism, different protein translation, and it has the rare ability to uh, replicate and produce a clone of itself that still can turn into different cell types, um, as well as another cell that is uh, on a, some sort of differentiation trajectory. So it becomes you know, skin or it comes a specific B cell versus a T cell and so forth. And it's a, it's a hierarchy, like there are more or less STEMI cells. It's not, again, a very specific um, cell type. What happens with age, of course, is that many things, everything gets messed up. And so including these programs that keep the cell STEMI. Um, and then what, it, what you can end up with is that you get a um, division event where both progeny cells are um, differentiated and so you lose the stem cell. And so there is um, demonstrably a decline in the number of stem cells in different organs um, with age. And like the DNA damage, it's not 100% clear that this is like super important for how normal aging progresses. It is super clear that with fewer stem cells, you're less able to regenerate. And so if you get, here's a picture of muscle tissue. Um, the bottom has all the stem cells depleted. And then on the left is before an injury. And on the right is after a barium chloride injection uh, that just blows up all your muscle. Um, normally, you start getting regrowth of muscle fibers um, which, you know, we all know if we've had a wound, but if you deplete all the muscle stem cells first, then you just get scar tissue. You don't get any new muscle fibers. And so clearly for regeneration, a uh, loss of stem cells is important, but in the various tissues, there's still arguments around like, do we really have replication? Maybe some of you have heard that like your brain never gets new cells after age, whatever. Uh, doesn't seem to be true. There is actually some neurogenesis uh, happening in your brain. It's at a very low rate. And so, you know, broad picture, it was still correct. Um, but as we get deeper, you know, we find stem cells being important in different places. The most important place, again, is in the immune system where your bone marrow um, is a source of constant division for producing new blood cells. You know, you get tens of thousands that die every hour. Um, and you need to replenish all of those. And when those stem cells get depleted, it's not good. You get immunosenescence. So as I mentioned, stemness is really a program. It's a state that cells can be in. And so the ultimate stem cells, the top of the hierarchy is your germline cells, which as we covered, can create a whole new organism, right? They can make everything. And what's interesting is that you can actually take cells that aren't germline cells, that aren't stem cells, and turn them into this. And so the 2012 Nobel Prize um, for Gurdon and Yamanaka was, Yamanaka's contribution was to find that if you just take these four uh, transcription factors, OSKM, and you express those strongly inside of like a skin cell, then you can turn it into uh, what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell. So pluripotent as in it can make all the cell types. Um, and induced, obviously. Um, and, you know, these cells, the cells that you can create like this, they can form new embryos. So, you know, if it's not going to have a 100% success rate, but I can, like, go get a skin biopsy from you, get some stem cell, skin cells, turn them into stem cells, and then differentiate them into cells that can become a new embryo. We can't quite turn them into eggs yet, or, like, that's kind of just bleeding edge. Some groups can kind of almost do it. Um, but that's the thing we can do, and we can do that in, in mice, and we can engineer the mice to program these, so we just put it into their genomes that we can turn on um, expression of these OSKMs, and when we do that, we can turn them into embryos. If you do it really sort of like full on, um, express all these all over the mouse's body, then you get this teratomas everywhere, so you get sort of like de-differentiation and like new embryogenesis everywhere, and it's not good. Uh, but 
was a paper from 2016 from the Salk where they did that, but they only did it sort of intermittently and with a low dose of the inducer of the genetically encoded OSKM factors. Um, and they did that in mice, both in an accelerated aging uh, bacteria model, um, where uh, you got sort of rejuvenation of different tissues and you got an extension of lifespan. Um, and they also did it in wild type mice, um, where they also saw rejuvenation of different tissues. Um, and then more recently, uh, this year, there was a uh, big paper from Harvard with like 17 different labs um, where they were doing this in optical nerves. And so they were restoring vision after different types of um, nerve injury. So like models of different um, age-related diseases that cause blindness and they could regrow um, the cells and it was great and the mice could see, um, it's amazing. This is uh, really cool and I would say promising I like it because as a sort of potential anti-aging therapy, I like it because it just hacks into s programs that are already present in your cell, right? So there's so much stuff going on that if you had to manually put everything in the right place, that would be very difficult. If you could just tell the cell, like, hey, remember when we like make babies, let's just <laughs> make ourselves a baby, right? <laughs> um, oversimplified, but um, it seems very effective at removing, so people have looked at like different aspects of aging, protein aggregates, epigenetics. Um, most of the things seem to get reversed with it. So there's like niche discussions, right? Like, oh, but not this thing. And like, that's probably true, but at least a lot. So the caveat is that I think from sort of uh, subtle things and hearsay and talking to people that this is a lot harder than it sounds. So why didn't they make these wild type mice live longer? Why didn't they measure that? Um, and I think they did actually measure that and they didn't publish it. And so I think they probably didn't live longer. Um, possibly they didn't live longer because they actually got teratomas and you had to like tune this really carefully. I don't know that. So I'm just speculating on, you know, like why aren't we all rejuvenated by now? Um, we know that there is a big risk and it seems like it would be important to get this exactly right. And so I think there's a whole, there's a very interesting sort of thrust uh, that should happen and uh, is happening in the aging field um, where we should just like really figure out how to nail this and how to do it without just initially genetically engineering us to have all these Yamanaka factors, you know, be expressed when we eat a certain pill. Um, how do we get it, uh, how do we get it to work in pill form is usually the the question for all <laughs> effective interventions like exercise. Um, so I do find this super, super fascinating and exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing what, what happens uh, moving forward. Um, another, the opposite of a stem cell, not quite, but is a senescent cell. And so we mentioned those earlier on. So senescence is also a specific cell state um, that can happen to any cell, any of us could undergo senescence. Um, it can be a senescent liver cell, lung fibroblast. Um, and what happens is that the cell stops dividing. Um, it sort of enlarges, it changes its metabolism, and it starts secreting um, a bunch of inflammatory cytokines and creates a specific niche uh, around itself. And it seems like that's important. The normal role of senescent cells, or at least a normal role of them, is that when you have some sort of damage, um, some sort of injury, and it can be a physical injury or like radiation. Um, you get senescent cells induced in the area and they start secreting all these SASP, senescence associated uh, secretory phenotype factors. So all these cytokines and uh, extracellular matrix remodelers. And they allow immune cells to come in, clean up all the damaged cells, and then you get regeneration. That's like how things should work. And when you're old, everything's messed up. And so what can happen is that the senescent cells accumulate and you do see an accumulation of these cells in different organisms, um, in different tissues with age. Um, and this can cause a state of chronic inflammation where um, they're just saying, okay, there's damage here, there's damage here. You can get immune cell recruitment, you can get uh, resulting fibrosis and so forth. Um, and it, it's not a good thing. And the clearest evidence that it's not a good thing is um, a paper, I'm using the one from 2016, the original one was from 2011, where they took um, wild type mice, except that they had engineered 
um, a genetic construct where when they fed them a particular drug, all the senescent cells would die, or at least all the cells expressing one senescent cell marker would die. And so they did this both in inbred lab mice and in outbred lab mice. Um, again, guess which one got the treatment? I guess it says right here. Um, they look healthier, they live longer. They don't live a lot longer in maximum lifespan, but the median lifespan is significantly increased. Um, and they just seem to be much better off. And so this has spawned a whole field of what's called senolytics. So killing, lytic is killing, and seno for senescent cells um, as a therapeutic modality uh, within aging that has gotten a lot of attention over the last uh, 10 years and does seem very promising. Um, there's been at least one bump in the road, and we're going to get to that in, in the last uh, section when we talk about biotech companies. Okay. So senescent cells, inflammation leads us beautifully into intracellular signals, just like with proteins. There's way too many of these for me to sort of like cover everything that goes on between cells. I'll just give two important examples. One is inflammation. And so inflammation is a good thing when you need inflammation. Um, if you stab yourself with a branch or whatever, uh, you get a bunch of bacteria in, then you get inflammation. And then the immune system knows where to go and where to kill out clear out all of these bacteria, eat dead cells, et cetera. So uh, this acute stimulated inflammation is an important response um, to various things that happen to you. But chronic inflammation is not so good. And so here's just one example, disease example, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is like lung, aggressive lung scarring, kills you in three or four years. Um, this is an uh, alveolus, so it's part of the little, one of the little air bubbles in your lung. Um, there's a bunch of alveolar cells along the side. If you smoke, if you get a bunch of asbestos, whatever, some of these cells will die. And what's supposed to happen is, you know, you just regenerate. It's an epithelial cell, um, which are proliferative, so it's fine. But with age, you have increased uh, chronic inflammation, decreased ability to regenerate. And so what you end up with is just sort of dead cells and then lots of regeneration signals. And regeneration is good, except when you do it too much. And so what happens in the lung is that the fibroblast starts secreting a bunch of extracellular matrix. You create a bunch of scar tissue, and that just keeps happening because you have this chronically activated um, inflammatory state. So you have a chronic sort of alarm signal, right? Um, that ends up with an overreaction uh, that stiffens your lungs and makes you unable to breathe. And so with age, the amount of chronic inflammation goes up. Uh, the term inflammaging is so often used to describe this. It's never really super clearly defined, but it's just like more inflammation with aging. Um, it was hard to find people actually measuring it, but it has been done, um, that these inflammatory cytokines uh, increase with age. And um, these cytokines, their circulating levels, their chronic levels are associated with you know, death, with neurodegenerative disease, just all kinds of bad stuff. So um, inflammation is a tool. You want it to turn on and then you want it to turn off. You don't want it to be on uh, constantly. And that's definitely like a big part of aging. I don't know how much of the aging process we can describe with just like, but then there was chronic inflammation and all the cells started reacting to stimuli that they didn't need to react to, right? It's kind of like, you know, you just got your back to the company. Someone just runs through the office yelling constantly, right? Like, <laughs> not useful. It starts to be distracting in any number of ways. People get aggravated and so forth. Um, so reducing inflammation is clearly sort of a promising angle for anti-aging, but the immune system is just tremendously complex. And these different cytokines have different receptors. And remember, you do want acute inflammation to be able to happen. You can't just turn off cytokines. Often when you do that, the mice don't even like, live uh, into adulthood. Um, and so finding the right way to fine tune this is pretty tricky. Um, clearing senescent cells is, is one promising angle there. A different type of intracellular signaling is uh, young blood or old blood. Um, and so this, again, journalists love this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because the original uh, aging experiments were done in the lab of Tom Rando at Stanford by uh, Irina Conboy, who's now a professor at Berkeley. She stitched mice together um, so that their blood circulation was shared and kind of mixed together. And so this has been done 
for decades, but nobody has had done it to a young mouse with an old mouse and then see what happens. What happens is that it seems like the old mouse gets younger uh, and the young mouse gets older um, physiologically. So there are different tissues where beneficial effects were seen in the, young, in the old mouse. The old mouse lived longer. It should be said that it lived longer than an old mouse stitched to an old mouse. Not that it, <laughs> it doesn't live longer than an old mouse <laughs> that you left alone. But <laughs> subsequently, um, in different labs, mainly here in the Bay Area, some at Harvard uh, and elsewhere, um, people started using young serum instead, right? Like, let's just put the blood. Forget about the whole <laughs> Frankenstein thing. Um, and that seems to work as well. And so here's just one uh, paper from uh, UCSF where they looked at the brain specifically and they looked at how many dendritic spines, so how many synaptic uh, synapse forming um, uh, spines were there in the brains when they had injected. This is actually, if I remember correctly, uh, human plasma uh, that was injected into the mice uh, from either young or old. And so when you used young, um, you had more dendritic spines, you had better memory. So this is sort of how many errors do they make uh, at a maze after you've trained them, um, which is a test for how well do they remember. So mice aren't the best model for cognitive stuff, uh, but this is just one example of any number where you know, there's muscle phenotypes uh, and different organs that seem to be regenerated by young blood. There's an ongoing debate about is it bad stuff in old blood or is it good stuff that you're then diluting when you have the long, young blood or is it good stuff in the young blood or is it both? And there's you know shots back and forth. I don't think it's 100% clear yet. Some people say it's just albumin, which is like your, your filler protein in the blood. It's just that, like just put in albumin. There was one paper where they just like put in saline with albumin, if I remember correctly. Um, that is still unresolved. There are companies that are working on, you know, obviously what you want to do here is like, again, get less sort of like creepy super villainy and just figure out what's the protein in the blood and then let's make some of that uh, and use that as a therapeutic. And there are companies that are doing that. Um, I would say the status of parabiosis is there's clearly something going on. It's another one of those, like there's clearly something here and it should be something that we can harness in a non uh, sort of insane way. Okay, so these are a, a wide tour of things that break with age and ways to prevent uh, that breaking. And as I've emphasized a little bit before, like they're not isolated, right? You can get uh, DNA damage that then triggers senescent cell state and then that affects the tissue, gets more inflammation that happens in your liver. Now your liver is metabolizing in a different way and then it's expressing different proteins and they're going into the bloodstream and so they're signaling different things and it's just all connected. And we're gonna talk about that a bit more in the next section, um, but it's evident that we need better ways of, of understanding what are these connections and like what are the causal relationships. Cool. All right, cool. So let's talk about um, sort of the landscape of what's happening in aging with a particular focus on what's happening in biotech rather than you know, everything we just heard about biologically is mostly what's happening um, in academia. Um, and also talk about what are the big challenges for the field, at least uh, from my point of view. Okay, so we've got our little you know, roadmap, map of the territory here. Over here is aging, we wanna treat it. If we can do that, we win, we all live longer. Um, our companies are successful, our glory is everlasting, etc. literally. Um, so if we think about, you know, we have all of aging and then we have specific uh, diseases of aging like Alzheimer's and um, myocardial infarct and so forth. And most of biopharma, so most of the sort of drug developing uh, community are focused on these individual diseases. And they have individual programs that are targeted at specific individual diseases. Those diseases are a subset of aging, um, but they're not all of it. Um, and they generate knowledge um, and understanding of how these diseases work, and then they, they move into the clinic. Then we've got academia, um, whose job it is to generate knowledge, and that knowledge includes knowledge about how does the basic aging process work. Although, as we covered in the introduction, that's kind of not a heavily funded area of research. Most of the money comes from the NIH. They're still pretty disease focused. 
and there's also foundations that are giving money to either all of biology or specifically um, to aging. And a little bit of that sort of academic work ends up um, with sort of a translational focus or translational potential um, and ends up being something that could be a drug. Um, that's obviously greatly accelerated once you start bringing sort of founder types happen in young disruptors or just people who know how to start a company um, and investors um, into the mix. And so a lot of the what's happening in the aging field is from startups um, that decide let's do something about aging. And the number of such startups has uh, gone up in the last decade, um, not because there's been anything that truly different about the last 10 years in aging biology. Certainly some of the things we just talked about um, were only discovered um, during that decade. But beforehand, we still had the sort of double your lifespan mutations. We still had young blood, etc. I think it's more that sort of word is spreading. It's becoming more uh, clear to more people that aging is actually something that you can uh, do something about. Um, some of the players in the um, aging field, uh, biotech aging field, are really big, notably um, Calico which is an alphabet company or an <coughs> alphabet uh, AbbVie partnership with at least two and a half billion dollars committed, uh, exec team from Genentech. Um, Cynthia Kenyon, their VP of aging, describes it as the Bell Labs for aging. You know, we're gonna have uh, researchers, including a bunch of people who were previously professors at different uh, universities doing basic research, using all of these cool tools that we can develop with our infinite pockets um, and a bunch of data science support um, and figure out how aging works. That's kind of their mandate, is do something about aging. Um, they are also clinically active. They're licensing drugs from different universities. Um, some of them are kind of aging focused. Some of them are more just cancer drugs. And there's sort of backroom whispers of at least two other initiatives that are sort of on this scope, on the billion dollar scope um, that could potentially do something about aging. I think, uh, let's see if those get announced um, this year. So there's some, what? I can't, I can't. I, it's whispers, whispers. Something about, there's something about milk, there's milk something and some other stuff. Some people are quitting their things and there's just stuff happening. Um, another thing that, um, started with this company, Juvenescence, um, but has multiple uh, incarnations now, is this sort of umbrella company or distributed company. So these are sort of half companies, half venture firms uh, that raise a bunch of money and then spend a lot of that uh, money uh, acquiring ownership in uh, early stage startups that are doing aging stuff. And then they additionally offer sort of like um, a Juvenescence, like, oh, we've got some great uh, drug chemists. We've got some people who've actually you know, gotten drugs approved. We've got this cool AI sort of core um, that we will support you with if you become a Juvenescence uh, company. And so there's um, at least three of these. Um, Juvenescence is uh, led by, or started by um, Jim Mellon, a rich investor in the UK. Life is sort of centered around David Sinclair and someone called Mimut Khan, uh, who's a sort of powerful exec, uh, formerly both in life science and at Pepsi. Um, Cambrian was initiated, um, or I guess the, the funding comes primarily from someone called Christian Angermeyer, um, who's sort of super pumped about aging and other um, futuristic health things. Um, and they all have different aging people involved, David Sinclair, James Payer. Um, so the landscape is, you know, I would have said two years ago when I gave this talk, I'm like, well, there's a lot of cool aging stuff. And, you know, if we just put more money into it, we could fund a lot more cool companies. That's like <laughs> less and less true. More and more, if you have, if there is a cool nature paper with some big finding about aging, um, there are these umbrella companies, they're gonna sort of like swoop in, um, like hyenas or whatever, animal. Um, there's also, oops, sorry. Yeah, let me just go straight here. There's also aging focused funds plus um, the overall, like it's not that hard to get startup funding as an early uh, stage company right now in general. Like there's a lot more money around uh, than there was maybe 10 years ago. So right now, 
what's short is more the research, like can we find good things to do and um, the number of people who would be good founders for an aging company. And in my opinion, you need, not necessarily in one person, but certainly in the founding team, you need both sort of good taste in aging science. You know that it's not telomeres or whatever, right? Like you know sort of what has been done in the field, uh, what do people, what are the sort of dead ends and so forth. And you know like what does it take to get whatever millions of dollars together, build up a team, how do you make a plan, how do you move forward? Um, we need more such people and so um, I started the longevity apprenticeship which is basically just sort of uh, a mentoring program where um, do stuff with me that could impact the aging field and then we'll cover a bunch of that stuff while we're doing it. Um, I know on deck which is this big sort of founder training program they recently started a longevity thing as well. Um, Laura has done this. There are a few of these things around, but certainly I think there could be a lot more um, people who are trained to do important things in the aging field. And we need a lot more basic science uh, to figure out all of the, well, you know, we don't really have the data yet stuff that I gave you <laughs> during the Q&A so far. Um, so funding is not the main problem. What is the main problem? Um, I'll go over three things that I think are the most important uh, bottlenecks for more progress in the field. And the first of these is, um, you know, let's say you have some cool aging science. What do you do with it? What is the project? Um, and so the standard biotech uh, sort of product model is that uh, you create a drug that cures a disease. So you've got your well, very well-defined customer base uh, that would love to have your product, right? There's no like, we gotta convince these guys to like not have diabetes. Um, and then you have a distribution system that is to some extent uh, gate kept by the FDA. If you get FDA approval, then insurance will pay for these drugs um, and uh, Medicare will pay for these drugs and you will uh, have dramatic sales and you'll be profitable. Even though, you know, like going through those clinical trials, there's a lot of failures, the success rate is only single digit percents. Even with like those difficulties, this is a profitable business model. Um, but there is a challenge for aging, which is that, you know, FDA approval comes on the basis of either preventing or treating undesirable outcomes. And it's not just the FDA, it's also sort of insurance will only pay for stuff if it's going to concretely do something measurably good for you that we all agree is an important thing. And that tends to be sick care. That tends to be, you have this disease and we now want to treat it. We want to make it go away. So we focused up here in the graph um, and down here, preventative medicine, I'm gonna give you this drug and you're not gonna have a heart attack 30 years from now. We do that in theory, like that's something that you can get through the FDA, specifically for cardiovascular events, right? Like um, we have surrogate endpoints, like cholesterol and blood pressure, that you can treat and get a drug approved just to lower uh, blood pressure. But it is much less um, sort of common or attractive than making something that already exists go away. Um, both because, I mean, there's all kinds of complicated good and bad reasons. Some of them are like, insurance would much rather pay for, you know, would not rather pay for something that might prevent your future insurance company from like having a big bill. Um, but also like very honestly, like it's, it's just, you know, one in the hand. If I give you a pill and says, this will make you live longer, you know, a long time from now, give me all your money. You'd be like, well, how sure am I, right? Like how sure can we be? Whereas if you have an acute condition right now and we can make it go away, that's very easy to measure. And so that makes it challenging to sort of prevent aging or to focus on aging. Um, and this is uh, compounded by the fact that most of the research we do is in this realm of like, where you're looking at these mechanisms of aging and our gold standard test for whether it's an aging paper um, is, is there a lifespan curve, right? Did you make something live longer? And so that's what we tend to do. We, we make, uh, find a way to boost mitochondrial function. We make flies live longer, um, which is cool. And like, clearly that's important. Like if we can make things live longer, that is important, but it's disconnected from what you run clinical trials on, which is here's a specific disease and we want to either prevent or treat that. And so there's a big gap 
basically between the um, fundamental science on the biology of aging, which is still where most of the discoveries are made, and then uh, where you can go uh, to get your drug approved. And so one option uh, here that seems very attractive is just like don't bother with the approval stuff, just sell things directly to consumers. So one notable company here is called Elysium. They'll send you, uh, sell you uh, nicotinamide riboside combined with resveratrol supplements and then you'll eat them and maybe you'll live longer and be healthier. Um, and there's many, many, many others. Um, a more recent sort of uh, cool angle on this is I won't treat you, I treat your dog, right? I'm gonna, there's three or four companies in this space. This is just two of them. Rejuvenate is using gene therapy um, to go after specific dog diseases. Uh, Loyal is uh, not using gene therapy. They have drugs for different pathways. Um, and they're basically saying, you know, I will sell this and your dog will live longer and you will see that pretty soon. In Juvenate's case, they're specifically saying, I will prevent this specific type of disease that your sort of inbred dog strain is extremely prone to. Um, and that's, I think that's a really interesting approach. The problem with this approach is you never know if it works. Um, here, you know, we could plausibly five years from now see that a bunch of dogs that normally live seven years uh, are now living, you know, 10 plus years. Um, and that would be cool. That would be like a sort of holy shit moment to, to uh, stimulate the field, right? And say, well, I mean, if it works on the dog, maybe I could just. <laughs> 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 Uh -huh. We know so much about mice and rats because we've studied them over decades. How much do we really know about dogs and all these other uh, animal models people, tr people are trying to introduce? Less. <laughs> but, but I think uh, these companies are focusing on animals that have uh, a lot of importance to humans for various reasons. And so that can be because they are pets. And so um, we've at least, you know, I mean, we made them into these sort of different, different dogs live different ages, right? And that's through our inbreeding. Um, and so people do genetics on dogs. Another uh, organism is horses, where you've got like race horses, um, which is a very big business. Um, and people care a lot about, like they'll definitely do genetic testing on their horses. They will definitely send their horse to like a semi-sketchy stem cell infusion clinic if it can't run. <laughs> yeah, um, we work with horses uh, at Gordian also, but, which we'll get to. But um, So clearly the answer is less, um, but in some cases quite a lot is known. I think in dogs, we were just talking about the IGF-1 pathway, which is the you know, d double the worm lifespan uh, pathway that I showed. Um, that is very clearly different in large dogs and small dogs. That's why they're large and small, and also is correlated with longevity. Not us? Um, you can probably say more yeah. about that. There's some, right? The FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine does regulate licensed therapies, um, and, you know, I thought it was called open source or somewhere trying to pursue FDA approval. The thing is that because the financial rewards are lower, um, a lot of companies don't seek FDA approval, and so veterinarians are mostly stuck using human label drugs off-label in animals. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have nearly as many. The pathway is shorter. But I think you can, if I have a dog, it's not illegal for me to just go inject a bunch of young blood or stem cells or whatever. Yeah, it's only, it's only illegal for me to charge you to do it for you. That's right. the practice. <laughs> I wouldn't bring you to do it yourself, but I'm legally property and you do whatever you like. So right. Um, so, so much less um, regulation. What was the other thing I was going to say about dogs? I don't, I don't remember. But... Um, Oh yeah, the, the other thing is uh, producing drugs for animals can be much cheaper because when you make a human, especially if it's like a gene therapy like Rejuvenate does for humans, it has to be you know, good manufacturing practices, you know, drug grade, et cetera. And that's just dramatically more expensive than it is to do it research grade, which you're allowed to use in the animals. Um, so those are advantages. There's also some issues, right? One issue is that if I'm just buying longevity for my dog, I generally will probably not pay as much money as insurance will pay to sort of cure my kidney disease or whatever it is by like at least an order of magnitude, uh, possibly two orders of magnitude. Um, so your profit margin is less. The other big problem is you are competing with, assuming you aren't yourself, uh, people who will just make shit up, 
right? Like, <laughs> I don't care at all whether this works. I'm going to beat you on salesmanship. And like science versus salesmanship in convincing humans, like science is not great, right? Like we've seen, <laughs> we've seen any number of examples of that <laughs> recently. Um, so if you actually want to make stuff that works and do real science, you've got kind of like a handicap, you know, and there's advantages, right? I'm sure that you can make a case for like, guys, look, this is like real, um, but you're still competing with people who will just make things up and just say that their thing does whatever it is and just cite, pay doctors, cite studies, whatever it is. Um, and so that makes it really hard, right? Like that's the good thing about the FDA. You have to actually prove in a trial that it's effective. So option two, which is, so what I'm listing here, let's say some of the well-funded um, early new wave aging companies. So from like a decade ago, the companies that started around a decade ago um, and succeeded at getting funding and getting into trials and so forth. Um, not that these are the only companies in the aging space or necessarily the best ones. Um, what these, this type of company tends to do is Let's pick, you know, we have an area of aging biology, let's say senescent cells for Unity or like mTOR pathway for Navitor or young blood. Um, let's figure out what are the diseases where this might be beneficial. And you get kind of a diaspora of different indications because as we've been over, like aging tends to drive all of these things. So now you have to figure out which of these do we want to go after. And you can see that they, they're kind of color coded. So, um, you know, there are duplicates here where these guys and these guys are both doing macular degeneration, everyone's doing Alzheimer's, et cetera. Like that's because they are also looking at where's the big unmet need? Where don't we have a good drug? Osteoporosis is not on here because even though that's a big problem, clearly age related, we have pretty decent drugs. Um, so they can do this kind of analysis, which are the indications that we should go after um, and then try to apply their aging technology there. And so if we look at one specific example of that, Unity, um, the original paper where they, kind of like the one I showed for senescent cells, but an earlier version where they had also sort of accelerated aging mice, was in uh, 2011 um, out of the Mayo Clinic. And the year after that was shown that clearing senescent cells could extend lifespan, Unity was formed. And they said, okay, let's go make a company out of this. This could be cool. And so Arch gave them a bunch of money um, to go figure out what to do. <laughs> And so at this point, they needed both to find a way to kill senescent cells that wasn't being a genetically engineered mouse. And so in 2016, they published, okay, we found these um, repurposed uh, chemo drugs. Let's see, the, they seem to be able to kill senescent cells. Meanwhile, they were doing studies on, within the company um, that happened to be located at the Buck, so I was kind of overlapping with them, on various different diseases. Um, and figuring out are senescent cells important here and generating some of that human data and generating animal data, um, supporting that like, okay, osteoarthritis, senescent cells are important here. And so osteoarthritis is um, the indication that they decided to start their first trial on, in part based on the results that are published in this paper, I think it was in Nature Medicine um, in 2017. Um, but unfortunately that trial failed. So they didn't meet their primary endpoint um, with their first drug, uh, UBX 101. The company is still around, now they're going after eye stuff. Their stock dropped a lot, obviously. Um, the endpoint for osteoarthritis is pain. Um, and that's pretty tricky. It's kind of subjective and so forth. Um, so it's not the easiest trial to run from that point of view. Nevertheless, um, you know, they, they didn't have to fail. Why did they fail? And you can find different people's write-ups on the internet around like, it's probably this, it's probably that. I certainly don't have any sort of secret knowledge around like, this is exactly uh, why the drug didn't do anything. Um, but I do want to point to one potential reason that I think at least contributes, which is, if you remember, this is the paper, right? Um, the animals that they used here, they're osteoarthritis animals. They are uh, male, black six, which is the standard mouse model, age 10 weeks. So they didn't get osteoarthritis from aging. Uh, they had surgically uh, induced osteoarthritis. And I'll spare you all the gory details, but basically you kind of cut a tendon in the knee joint and then you destabilize the joint and you get grading and the cartilage wears away and you get something that's very similar to osteoarthritis, uh, at least at the sort of gross uh, clinical level. 
Um, but it's not the same necessarily as age-related osteoarthritis. Go ahead. So this is this Canadian uh, group that studied at the uh, gene expression level a head-to-head -head comparison between experimentally induced osteoarthritis and age-induced oste osteoarthritis. Completely different mm -hmm. uh, genetic profile. So there is no correlation whatsoever. I think that's, you are right. That's like why I think Kuliti failed. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, and the, the thing is, if you look at their trial, right, it's almost like they selected against what this paper was about. So they had <laughs> only old people, no young people, both uh, genders, and then one of the exclusion criteria was you couldn't have like a traumatic knee injury for two years prior, right? So it's almost like the exact inverse. Um, and I don't want I'm not trying to be like, you know, making fun of unity, uh, because this is not a unity thing. This is like the default thing in biopharma is that you use these accelerated disease models because you don't want to like get 10,000 mice and then age them and then wait for them to spontaneously develop these diseases and not all of them will and so forth. Like it's too slow. And so you find an accelerated model, which makes sense, but it's also a liability, right? It can mean that you're studying uh, your evidence is in a system that uh, isn't where you want the, the drug to work. And so I think the big takeaway here, and we'll talk a bit more about sort of models and minding your models, but the big takeaway is again, like I was trying to emphasize in the beginning, like this is aging, this is aging, this is aging, but they're not the same aging. You can't assume that the arrow of sort of causality goes both ways and that as long as you've created osteoarthritis, then you have the same environment as sort of age-related osteoarthritis. Um, so does that mean that Synolytics is, you know, that's out? You know, there are other companies that are going after uh, killing senescent cells. Is that a bad strategy? I don't think there's any particular evidence for that. There's still, you know, those mice still live longer. There's still senescent cells in these different diseases. Um, it could just be that the fit between this is your therapy and like this is your specific disease uh, segment or the type of disease that you can work in um, needs to be good and unless you're very careful uh, that might not happen. Um, some of the, so I said these are sort of decade old biotech funded larger aging companies. Some of the newer companies are like BioAge for example um, are, I know, using old animal models. Gordian, we are also using sort of exclusively if whatever model is most relevant. So sort of progressive disease, spontaneous disease, older animals. And we'll see, right? Like my, I think that that will lead to better outcomes, but I haven't proven that yet. So just to recap, we have the FDA. The FDA are not the bad guys uh, necessarily. It's just as much that we just, we need to show improvement in something something that's well defined um, and they're just asking us for that there are initiatives which we'll get to in a moment for like let's make aging a disease my impression is the fda is not necessarily against that um, they are just they just come back with like what do you mean by aging <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you measure it right so you can avoid the fda you can also go through the fda um, the way that the companies generally do that is they don't go for aging, they go for a specific disease, but they know that their drug is kind of an aging drug. And so the hope is that this drug can work for many different diseases and diseases that aren't necessarily normally sort of associated with each other. Um, okay, problem number two, aging takes a long time, right? So going back to what is aging, we, can, we know it when we see it, um, but it's hard for us to give a very specific definition of sort of like here's this thing that we can measure. And so we default, like the gold standard is, you measure lifespan. You measure the whole process of aging and you see if it happens faster or slower than it's supposed to, than it normally does. And that means you have a really long measurement time, especially in humans, right? Like literally a lifetime uh, to measure aging. And if you have really slow measurements, then you have really slow iterations. You can't test many things. And then your rate of progress goes down, right? So this is just like the problem of biology relative to software accentuated, right? Uh, compared to the rest of biology. And so if we had a really good biomarker, if we had something that we could measure instead of waiting for all of aging to happen, then we could really speed up progress, both in the research grade, but also for the clinical trials. You wouldn't have to run the trials forever. 
So what is a good biomarker? Um, there's different characteristics. You want it to be predictive of something that happens in the future. So you want it to not just tell you about what is the state of the system now, but what's going to happen to the system so that we can use it to say, if this is lower, then you won't have a heart attack or you won't have these different diseases. Um, it should also be sensitive and specific to aging mechanisms or whatever the thing that you're trying to study is. And so to give an example of a biomarker uh, for aging where that might not be the case is, you know, there are apps or companies that will, uh, you show them a photo of your face, you know, and then they'll say, okay, this is how old you are using computer vision. And those might be sensitive. I don't know how sensitive they are, but they might not be very specific. For example, if you change your makeup, now you might look longer, but you're not gonna live longer, probably, right? So you have a case of, <laughs> otherwise I, I'm down, I'm willing. Um, <laughs> you have a case of low specificity, right? Like you have things that change your biomarker that aren't the things that you actually care about. Um, you might also have things that change your rate of aging that don't immediately change your face and then you would measure uh, a difference in those. If we want to use it in clinical trials, we need the biomarker to be non-invasive. It can't be sort of like an image of a slice of your liver or something like that, right? <laughs> Which is what, that's what we do to the mice, um, usually. So we want it to be measurable in, let's say, blood or some other fluid or with a scanner that's non-invasive. And then ideally, not essentially, but ideally, it's, uh, it measures something that we understand and we kind of know what it is measuring. And so, um, if, it's, if that's not the case, if it's measuring some pure correlative measure that we don't understand why um, this seems to track aging, then we are less able to determine is it going to be specific. And also, uh, it doesn't help us in like where do we look for a treatment. So if we had a good biomarker for aging that was based on, let's say, senescent cells, burden of senescent cells, uh, the fact that that's a good biomarker suggests that we should go find a bunch of senolytics and get rid of the senescent cells. Whereas if we have a biomarker that's sort of black boxy, it's still useful, um, but it just means now we have to test sort of blindly or using other hypotheses, a bunch of drugs. And then finally, ideally, this same biomarker can be used both in the model organisms that we work with on in the lab and in humans. So you don't have this risk of like, we measured it in this way in the, in the mice, and then we went to humans, we measure a different thing, and oops, they're not actually the same thing. So how are we gonna make biomarkers like that? Um, the most common approach is to get uh, samples from young and old people or young and old animals uh, get the blood and then measure a bunch of omics. And so measure proteomics, DNA, uh, methylation, different things that give you very multi-dimensional data and then look for what, is, what correlates with whatever we're interested in measuring. In this case, the difference between young and old. Um, there are also biomarkers that are based on computer vision, either with uh, sections of tissue or cells. Um, and they can also have great resolution. Like I mentioned, they won't be non-invasive. And so for clinical use, uh, they're gonna be less useful. Uh, you could use them for research and, and there's companies and labs that do that. So then what, you look for stuff that correlates with what you want to measure. For an aging biomarker, what you want to measure is, imagine we have these two different people with different aging trajectories. The blue uh, woman is aging more slowly um, than the orange woman. If your biomarker just measures their like time on earth, then you, it's gonna correlate perfectly with their actual age. What you want is something where that measures the orange woman as being older at any given time and then the blue woman. Um, and there are different biomarkers based on different omics. The most uh, popular successful ones so far are based on measuring uh, DNA methylation. So this is sort of uh, epigenetics, modifications of specific sites of DNA that correlate with what your cell is doing. Um, I would guess, I don't know why those are working best. I would guess it's a question of which time scale are they stable over. It's not too long. Like if you just measured your DNA sequence, that wouldn't change. So like not good. And if you measure something that spikes up and down on a daily basis, I think RNA is more in this category, um, then you might not get uh, the same signal strength. So that's my guess, I don't actually know. Um, but a lot of aging clocks have been developed since I think 2009 or 11 was the first ones. Um, initially just to measure chronological age, but now more biological 
Uh, the remaining challenges here are that um, we don't really know what they're measuring. So it's measure all the DNA methylation and then find stuff that correlates with lifespan or time of death and so forth. Um, but so what you end up with is like 300 CPG sites that are outside of genes. So you don't even know what genes they're sort of connected to um, and you don't know what they do. And because of that, it's hard to talk about the sensitivity and the specificity. Um, the sensitivity seems to be really good in terms of like how well does it match chronological age and so forth, but the specificity is, is less well known. Are they going to respond to drugs that uh, extend lifespan? And in, there's only a, a few studies where they seem to maybe. Are they gonna to respond to drugs that don't alter lifespan? Very plausibly, certainly if you just change DNA uh, methylation enzyme activity, like that probably would happen. We don't really know. We don't know if these are drivers. Nobody has yet done the experiment where you take those sites and you go and you force them into the young state and you see whether there's a you know, rejuvenating effect. Um, and they're not yet uh, clinically demonstrated. That's gonna be true for all biomarkers of aging, but we can't use them in the clinic right now. And so um, there's a bunch of sort of direct to consumer stuff where you can buy your DNA methylation age test um, and then it'll tell you I got one for free. It told me I was 34. I was 34. <laughs> because it wasn't interpretable, it was kind of, of limited additional use. Okay, so the point is they're not clinically actionable because they measure some aging thing. How do we get there? How do we make a clinical biomarker for aging? Mm -hmm. The underlying problem with this is, is that it's, it's taking a, a cross-sectional approach to developing a biomarker for a longitudinal problem. Where you're taking samples from young and old and assuming that the difference represents the progression over time, mm -hmm. which is more efficient than taking samples in a cohort for a long period of time and, and waiting to see what happens. But do you think that, that fundamentally we're going to be inhibited from getting something that is predictive of real-world outcomes if we take that approach? I think people have done that, right? So especially in, in animals, right? Like that has been done, but also in humans. So like BioAge, the company, for example, their big start was like, I'm gonna go get the blood of 500 Estonians or whatever, where the blood has been banked at different times. And then they had good electronic health records that they could correlate with that. So, so people have done that as well. I think that is a, an overcome limitation. A different type of limitation that's generally true when you do omics is, um, are the things that we've measured to change with age the drivers of aging, bad stuff, or are they defenses against the bad stuff, right? Like, do you have more aggregated proteins and so you've upregulated your chaperones or whatever, upregulated your DNA repair, and so you think this is a biomarker for aging, but it's actually healthy and so you definitely don't want to go change it. Or is it, you know, category three, stuff that changes with age as a result of the drivers, but it's not in itself a driver. So that challenge exists there. Um, the first angle that I'm gonna talk about in terms of how do we get clinical aging biomarkers is um, I think uh, exemplified by something called the TAME trial where they're using metformin and they're trying to do this. Um, and so it basically consists of take old people, give them a drug or a placebo, then do all the omics, measure a bunch of things in their blood and measure their incidence of different diseases, including death. And so in same, I forget, is it nine or seven different, I think it's um, somewhere there, different indications where they measure the incidence over a period of six years. Um, and they see if giving these people metformin, which has extended lifespan in some animal models uh, and is very safe, it's a diabetes drug that you know, millions of people get, is that going to um, extend their lifespan or reduce the incidence of these different diseases? If it does, then whatever changed in the blood with metformin this is our biomarker for aging, right? Because this is what we think will correlate with reduced incidence of this multimorbidity. So we've defined aging, we've produced a biomarker for aging insofar as aging is like this specific multimorbidity and that biomarker could become a surrogate endpoint and so you could get to this sort of cholesterol for aging state. Um, the challenge is it only works if the drug works. So if this drug doesn't have an effect on these diseases, then you get a bunch of blood with the drug, right? Uh, but you don't get an aging biomarker. And so my guess is you're, they're gonna have to do this potentially more than once in order to find a drug that really has, and you have this kind of catch 22 where you need an aging drug, 
and you can't make the aging drug because you don't have like your trial for aging and so forth. Um, so that's a challenge. It's not insurmountable. Um, I'm calling this sort of census style because it's like if you want some information, uh, it's sort of just brute forcing, go out and like ask everyone, right? Or in this case, try a bunch of drugs, set up a d different clinical trial for each of the drugs, see if the drugs work and then measure all the things and develop your biomarker. Um, so that is, uh, the team trial is, have they, they've been trying to get funding for a while. I think I heard that they finally have funding, but I think I've heard that before. I'm not sure if it's like, it's not officially started, but I think it might be close. Still, still trying to raise money. Um, 60 million total. Um, theirs is a pretty big, it's like 3,000 people at like 14 top end clinical sites um, and so forth. I've definitely talked to people who say, oh, we could do this for like 10 with a different drug. Um, so maybe there's gonna be multiple of these uh, starting. Um, we'll see. Is that just a larger version of the study that came out a few years ago or are they doing something fundamentally different? Uh, which study came out a few years ago? Um, I thought it was called Pain. Maybe it was called something else. But it, it was um, IGF and human growth hormone and, rap, and metformin, I believe. The, the, those were the treatments? Yeah. yeah. Right. So Greg Fahey. So that's a different trial where that trial, like Tim is 3,000 people, like well powered and so forth. Trim was like less than 10 people. Yeah. And, and no controls, if I remember correctly, no placebos. So, so they did reduce the, um, the DNA methylation age of the people in that trial, but it's super underpowered. That was just like a preliminary study. I one thing I'm a little bit concerned about with this approach is like, can you actually identify a biomarker that changes with biological age, but not chronological age, or effectively separate the biological and chronological age? Because it seems like, at least with the, you know, the methylation-based biomarkers, you can exercise hard for three to four weeks and lower your biological age by like two to three years, mm -hmm. depending on where you start. And like, I don't know that It shouldn't respond so quickly. It shouldn't de-age by two years. And so the question is, what is it actually measuring? It's not measuring your biological state, maybe, but maybe it is. Like, I don't know if you exercise really hard for like four weeks, what is your actual risk of death? I don't know, like some actuary would know that better than me, but maybe your actual risk of death in that period is much lower. I think that's, I would tend intuitively, I think I would be on sort of in your camp of like, no, it shouldn't be that much lower. Right? And so maybe they're responding too quickly to stuff. Um, and that's, that's exactly the, like, what exactly are they measuring issue. And so I think we need more work <clears throat> to characterize what exactly are they measuring if we want to use them. Or what we're trying to do, that's, like, that's the point of this scheme, right? Is that this drug will change your biological age. That's the hypothesis. And if you measure that it does, then like, that is what the biomarker is measuring. And people are trying to do this with the methylation clocks also, where they measure sort of, instead of biological, it's like incidence of specific diseases, and so can you change that? But they, it has the same problem of unknown specificity. So, um, so this is the census style approach. A different approach um, that I kind of like, um, we'll get to why it's called Facebook style. Well, basically it's called Facebook style because it tries to uh, produce something that you would love to use that gives me the data that I would like uh, without you having to care about me. And so um, the idea here is that you just forget about aging for a minute. Let's drop like we're trying to measure organismal aging as our biomarker. Um, instead, we assume the geoscience um, proposal that these mechanisms of aging are driving aging and aging is driving disease. And so there should be some link from here to here. So let's just develop a biomarker that for a given 
mechanism of aging, and you can choose whichever one you think it'll be easier to make a biomarker for. Let's make a good biomarker for that. So non-invasive, specific, sensitive, etc. cetera. Um, and then go test that biomarker against different diseases of aging. If you're, so you do need to run a trial here, but you don't need your drug to work. You just need this to actually be predictive of any one of these diseases. You test that, if it works, and it should work to some degree, whether you're gonna have the power to detect that effect is less clear. I don't know what the, uh, how much power you need, how big a trial needs to be. But if it works and you find that this is actually a predictive metric for just one disease of aging, now you have something that's clinically relevant, right? So now you have a surrogate biomarker for this disease and people are working hard to do that for Alzheimer's and uh, NASH, different diseases where like the progression takes a long time and we would love to have a biomarker. And so what you can do with this is you can go to pharma and say, I have a biomarker for this disease, you should use it, and then they're gonna use it in all of their trials. And if some combination of you, government programs, um, and the pharma themselves develop these biomarkers for different mechanisms of aging, and then get them validated as a clinical, clinically usable marker just in one condition, now, um, you start having these being measured in clinical trials that you aren't paying for. You don't have to raise $60 million each time. Uh, you get the data, I mean, you don't get all of the data, but the pharma generates the data and they are forced to share some of it and they have others, other parts of it on how does this biomarker do on different age-related diseases. You know that the biomarker is actually measuring uh, biological aging or mechanistic aging biomarkers, right? They don't have to care about that. They don't have to care about aging at all. They're just using the biomarker. And you get to define aging now as basically the mapping of which specific areas of biology drive which specific dysfunctions, which is sort of clinically actionable. And the cool thing here is that when you do that, you sort of weaponize every trial. Like my dream version of this, which you can read more about in the QR code, um, is that the government then says, oh, hey, aging's a big deal. Demographics are, you know, we're getting older. Medicare is definitely gonna go bankrupt. Um, we should find a bunch of aging drugs, or let's be conservative. We should find a bunch of preventative multimorbidity drugs so we can treat many diseases at once. Um, and the government sets up a program that says, okay, every trial in the US, you need to measure these aging biomarkers. You need to just include some extra blood and we're gonna send that to our centralized facility that measures all of these biomarkers in every single trial. And now we're gonna do you know, more than a thousand times as many aging drug uh, discovery clinical trials as we're currently doing. So this is kind of an incentive hacking version of that um, that I fancy. I'm sure there are other approaches to doing this, but this is just to give an example of, we clearly need biomarkers to speed things up um, and we need those biomarkers to measure not just aging as measured by like a methylation clock or something. We need something that we can bring to the FDA. We can bring to the clinical trial designers and say, here's concretely what we're going to measure. And we care about this outcome. I'm curious, like, with the state of things like with, with aging say in a place like China where they just know their demographics are getting skewed and like they know the costs are gonna be quite large, are they, are they investing in this to like do stuff like that? Um, I don't know a ton about what's happening inside of China. I know there's some stuff in that direction. The place that's maybe most uh, forward thinking there is Singapore that has similarly aging demographics and generally pretty sort of high level of infrastructure and science. And they're actively like the National University of Singapore is they're running clinical trials for like aging stuff and they're trying to do all these kinds of things. Um, Japan, Japan are like, Yes, we have this big problem and we need to solve it, but not like with weird young blood stuff. Like there isn't a lot of sort of like biotech innovation. I mean, there's definitely some, bi there's biotech innovation in Japan, but this sort of like aging push isn't happening as much as you might think. And in China, I, I don't have a great view of like what really is happening on the inside. I know there's some, but I don't know if it's like a ton.
unless there was some other question or someone. Yeah. So, so the team people are heavily pushing for that and like um, that kind of thing. Um, this approach um, is different than the team approach. I am sort of like extreme back burner sort of pushing this. I mean, this link will just take you to sort of a two page. Here's what we could do. Here's like the rough budget for what we could do and that kind of thing. Um, but I mean, I'm doing Gordian and then <laughs> there's some, I'm doing some aging grants right now. So like that is a thing that I do want to push on like all of my Sundays, 2022, maybe, um, you could, the initial barrier is developing these biomarkers. And that's something that you could do, um, as a startup, as some sort of like research organization foundation. If someone, you know, some billionaire is like, yeah, I want to put like $50 million into this. Let's make like these three biomarkers. I think that's pretty doable. You snag some academics. Um, I'm trying to push more towards like, can we get pharma and academics in the same room and just kind of agree that this would be cool and then do it together. But, but you could do it just like sort of throw money at the problem, uh, sure. the initial stages here. Yeah. I think it's like the resource, like which biomarkers would we go after? I like, I already spit out like sort of an initial list. I don't think it would be that hard to like get to like which ones make more sense to go after, uh, like would be harder. Um, but it is going to be a pretty long R and D process. Like the, that part where you make it both non-invasive specific and sensitive, like that's going to be the challenge. And so you're going to have to do a bunch of animal work where you say, okay, in these animals, we can induce senescent cells. We can remove senescent cells. We can generate signal. And then we have to measure what's going on there. And then the human samples, maybe we get some postmortem samples and we kind of correlate, but your data is more scarce. So there's a whole process there. That's hard. Like people are trying to do this with Alzheimer's and there are some promising new things, but it has been sort of years in the making. Um, I do, you know, often advocate, like if I ever run into someone who's like, what should I fund in aging? This is high on the list. And I do want to, and I think we'll be able to at least sort of get it proposed towards like government uh, institutions. I think what I would consider an aging biomarker is something that's predictive for more than one disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a sense, you talked about, you talked about specific diseases that affect each of these organs and looking at the biomarkers for those specific diseases, but is there, a, do they have to be different in different baskets or are they? Sorry, do you mean like this step here or? Do you mean this one or do you mean, do you mean the census? This one. Okay, so um, what I mean is develop a biomarker that you are sure measures an aging process. Mm -hmm. Then test whether that biomarker has predictive power against different diseases of aging. You just need one hit. It doesn't matter which disease it is. Then you can get it into clinical trials as a surrogate uh, biomarker. And so you're just developing a biomarker you're putting an additional constraint on your development that it must measure a process of aging because if it does, you believe that you'll be able to use that more broadly than just one disease and you'll be able to map out how does aging actually drive disease, which we don't know. Um, so that's kind of the process. And with the trip, pharma and the government, is he studying aging Sort of, yes, or I mean, nicer way to put it was like, you don't have to reform the entire NIH system and say, drop all your other institutes and then infighting and like, you know, hard people are like, no, actually hard is most important. It's, you just sidestep all of that by saying, yes, heart. And I just like made a, a constraint on it that also it's aging, right? And then we all win. What's like big pharma's approach to aging? Like what's their reactions to it? Um, 
I would say increasingly interest. I've had some conversations, so there's certainly people in the world who know more about this than me. Um, increasingly interested. So my, my postdoc mentor at the Buck, um, who studies sort of regeneration in the context of aging, he was recruited to Genentech um, sort of in the later, when I was on my way out, um, and he's still there. Um, and I know Regeneron have um, a bunch of aging people uh, working there. Um, so there's some amount of interest. There's some amount of like, yes, clearly, you know, aging is important for these diseases. There is, as far as I can tell, not really any interest in like, let's treat aging instead of individual diseases. Like we're not, we're not at all there yet. Um, but sort of aging biology might be relevant to diseases, like we're getting to be there. That's my impression. And some of them, I would say, yeah, Genentech tends to be more sort of like uh, forward thinking, futuristic, whatever, out of than you know, Merck uh, main ship. The, the, the less time a company has been in existence, I think the sooner it will start looking at aging stuff. <laughs> okay, um, so two different approaches to biomarkers. Um, there are startups that are basically developing biomarkers. Um, Spring and BioAge are just two examples. There are others. And they develop biomarkers for aging as a tool towards, like, can we use these to find drugs? But, you know, I greatly appreciate them because in doing so, they also generate biomarkers that potentially could be used to increase the knowledge, at least insofar as they are sort of permitted outside of the company um, and could speed up clinical trials. So biomarker development, like, huge to do uh, in aging. There is clearly interest there. There's a lot of work happening in methylation clocks and we could easily like just 10X the amount of effort put into biomarkers. And in my opinion, especially sort of like human clinically relevant biomarkers. All right, last problem. Uh, aging is complex. I think hopefully that's already sort of like rehashing old territory now. Um, and so the problem is that we need to optimize that system. We need to optimize a complex system. We're not just solving a simple problem. So let's look at the biggest lie in biology. Are you ready? Boom. It's not the apoptosis pathway. The apoptosis pathway is actually real. Um, what I refer to as the biggest lie is this illustration of this like nice linear one thing causes another deterministic path of how cells commit suicide, which is the apoptosis pathway. And sure, this is fine for like undergrad textbook, um, but it's misleading. So here's another diagram of the apoptosis pathway you've seen before. This is still only like 10% to where it's probably happening. Um, but you can see instead of having like one thing, one arrow here causes this, you have convergence, different things cause this, and you have stuff that goes back and forth and in circles, and you get all these feedback loops, which is what distinguishes biology um, from, I don't know, engineering. Um, and creates these nonlinear outcomes, right? And this is important because it means that every explanation you have that's like telomeres run out, then aging, like these super simple explanations, it's never the whole truth. Um, and this also means that uh, in biology, I try to say there's no strictly better or worse. Everything is context dependent. And here's one example where uh, it's a meta study and it, each dot is one paper, and they measure if, if the dots are to the right of the line, then this, eating this food is gonna give you a greater risk of cancer. And if it's on the left, less risk of cancer. And you can see that not, <laughs> the message isn't perfectly clear, as you may have sort of experienced already in sort of science journalism. Uh, onions are probably good for you, uh, maybe lemon. Uh, don't eat pork, you know, don't eat sugar but a lot of other things, it's just all over the place. And this is not because these individual papers are wrong. Maybe some of them are. Like maybe they're just sloppy and bad. Uh, but it can also be because this paper only looked at people in Mississippi and the demographics were like suburban parents or whatever. And this one was actually done in India. And there's just like all these differences between the two different contexts. And so this is a really important part of biology that there are so many variables. You cannot control all the variables. You don't even know all the variables. There's too much dark matter that we don't even know yet. Um, and so saying that something is like, this is better, and then putting it into a different context, transfer learning, is really hard. 
And so to take an aging specific example, let's get back to IGF-1. You remove the IGF-1 receptor, you remove one of two copies uh, of it in mice from birth, and then they live longer. The females live more longer than the males. So already you're seeing that like context dependence. But then let's look at a different study of IGF-1. So here we're just looking at the bone marrow and the blood stem cells. And here IGF-1 goes down with age. And when you put it back into middle-aged animals, their immune system gets better and the bone cells are rejuvenated, right? So you've got the same protein and it just has not different effects, but just like it's in a different context depending on the details of the study. And so that means again, like why, why do clinical trials fail? They fail because we took one system and then we got some results. And then we assumed based on that, that in a different system, we map our results onto that and exactly the same thing's gonna happen. It doesn't, right? And so we need results in the context that we want them to apply. And this is where we get close to Gordian and also to the, to the Unity stuff. Aging only happens in vivo. Aging only happens in animals. Most of, or a lot of biology that we do, it's in cell culture dishes. So we can maintain cell lines, put them in growth medium, uh, in little plastic wells. The plastic's really hard. It's much harder than the extracellular matrix that they're normally in. Obviously there's no like liver hormones going around or different other cell types. Uh, the oxygen level is much higher than what it is inside of the body. Um, and you're missing all of these types of signals that the cells are getting. And many of these are the things that change with age. So you get advanced ligation end products in your extracellular matrix. Um, and that triggers signals in the cells. Um, you get senescent cells, they lead to inflammation, you get immune cells coming in. You have all of this sort of complex interplay that's happening in vivo and the changes of which are a big slash the majority part of the aging process. And so if you wanna study aging, you really want to uh, study things in vivo. If you want to know, does my drug work? Then you really want to know in an animal that like aged and spontaneously developed this disease in a similar way to humans and that has similar physiology to humans for the organ of interest, does my drug work there? That would be a heck of a lot better than sort of what we often do. And so this is, you know, Gordian has one solution to how do we deal with all this complexity uh, of aging biology, which is don't deal with it. Um, <laughs> basically we've created a platform where we can screen, as Seth said, many different therapies inside of a living animal. This means we can use the most relevant animal model. We can take an old primate that's sort of, or an old horse that spontaneously developed osteoarthritis, which we're doing. And then we can, using gene therapy, we can put uh, many therapies. We create many different viruses that each carry a different therapy with a barcode so we can recognize them. Um, and we put that into the organ. You can sort of barely see the other liver cells here, but the green ones are the minority of cells within that organ, in this case, a liver, that receive one therapy. And then the majority of the organ doesn't receive any therapies. And so what you end up with is a bunch of independent cellular experiments inside of all that in vivo complexity that we were just talking about, inside of the aged deceased system. And then we can extract those individual cells and we can ask using a multidimensional uh, measurement, just like with the biomarkers, uh, what happened to all the different areas of cellular activity and the different features of disease. If it's uh, NASH fatty liver disease, then we can say, what happened to fat? What happened to fibrosis? What happened to inflammation in those individual cells? Um, that received intervention A, B, C, D. And then we can look for ones that within this complex environment, um, restore cells to a healthier or younger or what have you state. And so this solution is basically just, you know, there's a Gordian knot of complexity, all these different things going on in aging. I've shown you countless times, like everything's connected. How do we get at that? And Gordian solution is just like, Get in the perfect model, ask your question, get your answer that's relevant for the co where you want it to work, and get out, <laughs> right? Um, and go run a clinical trial. Cool, and then, I mean, longer term, just cast away comment. This is just one angle at like, how do we address this problem of biological complexity? Cut the Gordian knot by being able to do your screen in 
uh, all the complex environment you want. The other cool thing is that this uh, readout is multidimensional and it gives you sort of like what's the senescence score of these cells and so forth. And so insofar as there are shared aging mechanisms that drive multiple diseases, as we do screens in more than one indication and we find, you know, our data will show us these driver mechanisms that affect more than one indication. And so it starts giving us information also about how to just the aging process work, which we can use to like figure out, is this therapy going to work in this new disease? And we create this sort of self-reinforcing uh, pool of data that lets us get better with every screen. So that's just one angle of attack on like this excessive complexity. We also just need way better tools to study the relationships between these things. So forget about the individual aging processes. How do we measure whether A causes B or not? Whether there's DNA damage and there is short telomeres, which one is causing which and how? And I think, you know, for the most part, we need much better tools. And so I'm going to just get into some angles of attack that people are using for this, but it's very much imperfect. And so one of them is like just more resolution on everything. Do single cell, split the, the organ into all the individual cells, me measure the full heterogeneity of those cells. Um, and then that single cell field has just like dramatically exploded in the past decade. And so this is a paper from this year where they're measuring, we can measure both the RNA that's in a cell, we capture that in one way, then we can measure protein levels in the same cell, capturing the information in a different way, and then we can measure the epigenetics. And so we can just get all the data with all the ways. And then we're gonna have a mega data set, and then we're gonna do some sort of Bayesian correlate, uh, causality modeling or something like that, and we're gonna figure out what causes what. And this is not like, tr that's not surefire uh, way to succeed, but it is becoming possible and it is gonna give us more data that we didn't have before. Um, another angle is let's use uh, non-destructive assays. So this is from uh, a researcher at Calico, um, who wrote a sort of opinion piece review paper about like, here's what we should do. We should measure all the different things we can measure in mice, like their muscle strength and their BMI and their walking speed. And we should videotape them and do AI and just get all the things. And then we should measure changes in that network over time. And that is also an approach where you get all the data. Now you're getting just the non-destructive data, um, but you get the time element. You have the same thing of like, what's actually, you just have a lot of, a lot of data. And so, yeah, if you Google that, you can find ways <laughs> to do things with that data. And then just coming back to these biomarkers, insofar as you have not just necessarily these clinical trial biomarkers, but you have mechanisms. You can measure, this is definitely this thing. We know that this is this thing that we can measure. And you then start creating effectively a relational database of that with outcomes that you care about. Then you can start to study the relationships with stronger um, sort of causality modeling. But all of these are like imperfect solutions. What we really need are assays that capture sort of time resolved effects, right? Like what if you could do the single cell sequencing, but you're not just measuring the RNA that's there right now, you could measure the RNA that was there a month ago. And there are some cool synthetic biology tools being created for that, um, but it's nascent. And that would be a thing that really helps the aging field. Can't we just do AI? And then the AI will solve it for us. Yes, we can just do AI, uh, but <laughs> we need the right data, right? And so you need the data that gives you information about the system that you don't understand. So for example, we have a lot of data on chemical structures and people are successfully using AI to generate new chemical structures that have similar activities to the other chemical structures, but they aren't under the patent that is frustratingly preventing you from making money or whatever. Um, so there are areas like this also, um, you know, uh, oncology, uh, like radiation oncology, or like skin uh, cancer detection, those kinds of things where we have a lot of good data, we have a well-defined problem and we can do AI. But we don't have that for like, let's understand aging. And just one simple example is, if you look at Spring, one of the sort of, we are a machine learning for aging company, and you look at who they hired, they hired a lot more biologists than they hired AI people or data science people, um, because they needed to generate the data that they could you know, do their computer vision on. And they needed that data to be relevant. And they need to think about like, where does this data apply? You know, where can we transfer learn? And so I think what we need, I'm very bullish on is, let's find ways to capture the right data that lets us select uh, or sort of and do machine learning uh, and answer some of these questions that we have about how does aging biology actually work. 
And so I think just in brief, like where has the field been? Where are we going? We've had these lists of different aging mechanisms and we're increasingly going towards, we know that these are connected. We have a system of aging. There's kind of like systems biology of aging is a thing, but not really. There's only a couple of people who say that and we're kind of scattered in what we actually mean by that term. Where we're gonna go, uh, I predict over the next decade is we're increasingly going to say not only are these different aging mechanisms connected, but in different tissues, there's different structures of aging mechanisms that apply. And so we're increasingly going to study those as independent things and stop looking for like the silver bullet aging thing that affects everything um, in the same way. And so we've got this whole space um, that we've built up over time. This is what's going on very briefly. I think I'll just let that be and, and um, you know, people can look at these slides uh, later. The one thing I'll point out here is this AI enabling company um, that I think is super important. There are a number of companies like that that are not really slash peripherally in the aging field, but they're generating new platforms that allow them to get the relevant data to answer uh, biological questions. Hockton is a good friend of mine and I'm super excited about what they're doing. Can measure uh, sort of activity of multiple receptors simultaneously. Um, obviously Gordian as well as these other aging, uh, aging focused companies. What these companies can do is both use the power of uh, machine learning and so forth uh, to make progress, but also they can simultaneously encompass individual diseases of aging and with sort of multidimensional data can measure aging itself and, and how that works. And so a summary of the talks, um, aging is extremely expensive and also it sucks. And so we should try to do something about it. Uh, we know that we can do something about it. We know that aging is a malleable biological uh, process that we can intervene on. And we know a lot about what happens, but we don't know how the whole system works. This is the critical sort of missing piece. And an important part of driving aging forward is linking this aging thing, whatever it is, to specific diseases. Um, if we can do that, then there are great rewards for you know, whatever company cracks this. But we need better tools to measure aging. We need better definitions, we need biomarkers. Um, and finally, I'll say there's no cavalry. I mentioned that there's a lot more money for early stage aging companies right now, but like there isn't, there isn't like some secret science base on the Antarctic where they've got this all figured out. Calico does not have this all figured out. It's not like over because, you know, Google is doing it. And so if you want stuff to happen, you know, go do something or talk to people, figure out what could be uh, useful. And that's it. Any last questions? I can clap and question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.